Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. Our lucky number is four because we are talking about John Wick Chapter 4 and we are talking about Resident Evil 4, the new one, not the old one. We did an episode on the old one. It's great. You can go listen to that from last year. We're going to give our first impressions of the Resident Evil 4 remake and we're going to do a full spoiler review of John Wick Chapter 4, which to give my spoiler free impressions right at the top, Sean, is the greatest movie of all time. You know, it's 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 up there. It's the it's the uh, it's easily the best John Wick movie. Uh, I think it is. If you like John Wick, the holy fucking shit, this movie kicks ass. Yeah, I think I think we should cease calling them movies. I think they are John Wicks from now on. I think John Wick <laughs> has has earned just retitle it. That is what they are now. Uh, and I think John Wick Chapter Four is is the best John Wick in several senses of that word. Yes, you know, movies used to be called talkies. Now we call them movies. Now they're, the, but in the future they must be wikis, uh, is what they are. <laughs> but not that kind of wiki. No, like a, no. yeah, all right. No, it's spelled with no. a C. Seriously though, uh, it's it's phenomenal. It's an A plus. It's ten out of ten. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. I, absolutely. Uh, it is. It's a great fucking movie. And Resident Evil 4 is pretty great, too. Uh, I, I guess we should start there. I don't have any other, like, stuff or news this week, so I thought we would just kind of dive into these. Do you, Sean, have any other stuff or news? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's mostly been yeah. playing since it came out. I even, like, I, I stayed up a little bit later than usual just to just <laughs> to get to the end of the Village section of Resident Evil 4 Remake because I was very excited nice. to play it. I wanted to at least get through the part that was in the demo. Um, yeah. And so, yes, I've been playing it basically since Thursday night. I've been playing it since Friday night because I went to see John Wick Thursday night because uh, I just had to. Uh, <laughs> and so, yes, I've been playing Resident Evil 4 as well. We will save like full spoilery thoughts on the game for later uh, because we're also not done with it. I am through Chapter 6, so they just reached the castle. Where are you, Sean? Um, I'm a little bit further than you. I'm in like halfway through Chapter 7 probably, so I'm like a little bit into the castle stuff. Like okay. I've met the... Um, Garador, the blind guy with the giant knives on his hands. Um, so oh, I'm a little nice. bit past that sequence. It's a great game. It's it's yes. fantastic. What are you thinking about it, Sean? It's yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, it's uh, you know, I'm I'm incredibly impressed by the line they're able to walk with, like evoking so much of the original game, both in terms of obviously like the content, like the environments and enemies and all that kind of stuff, but also the game design for the combat. You know, which, you know, we got a good taste of in the demo, but the demo only gives you like a small smattering of weapons. You have the pistol, you get the shotgun for a little bit. You don't get to engage with any of the like upgrade mechanics or anything like that. So you only got a little taste of what those mechanics were like in the demo. But being able to play the full game, I think the ways in which they evoke the original combat design of Resident Evil 4, um, but are still like like making it a more modern playing game, which it needs to be. You know, there's no version of this remake that's going to have the you plant your feet completely kind of thing in original Resident Evil 4. The modern audience isn't going to like go for that kind of thing. Um, but being able to replicate a lot of what made that original combat system really great while then pushing it into different directions, um, it is just an incredibly fun, satisfying game to play. It's It's so much better than I think certainly I expected or that it frankly has any right to be given what mm -hmm. it is attempting to do. Like it is, it is definitely, it is part sort of Resident Evil 4 remake in the same way Resident Evil 2 was a Resident Evil 2 remake and that it takes the original and expands on it. But it is also like part Resident Evil 4 master quest in this weird way. Like mm -hmm. to compare it to like Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, like a remixed version of it because it is made, I think with this intense awareness that Resident Evil 4 is not just one of the most beloved games of all time, but it is one of the most played and replayed games. People who like Resident Evil 4 know that game inside and out. And so yeah. it feels like it is hyper-focused on everything in the game is sort of something recognizable, but it almost always comes at you in a surprising way. And I think that's something really fun about it. Like, I got to 
an area earlier today that is one of my favorite encounters in the original game. It's near the end of the village sort of large section, that first third. And it's where you have that all the you have a person with a chainsaw and you have a bunch of zombies or um, mm -hmm. plagas come out. And it's sort of that two tiered like the place you're in where there's the kind of rot risen like planks that you can walk on. And then down there's like kind of the the big like dirt area. Um, and you come at it from a completely different direction. Like you yeah. enter that area from the from what in the original game would be the back of it. And so and there's no one there yet. And so you're walking around going. Wait, I know, I know this place really well. This is different. I'm at coming at it from a different direction. What is going on here? And then I don't want to spoil what they do, but they do something pretty fucking crazy with it, and it becomes one of the most insane encounters in the game. And you're pushed from that. And I think the game is like constantly doing little things or big things that sort of uproot your expectations while still being like identifiably Resident Evil Four. And that is such a neat trick to play. And when you combine it with the really incredible shooting mechanics and everything they've kind of reworked. I was saying this to my brother last night because we were talking about it. You know, Resident Evil 4, the original, is one of the most unique games ever made. There's basically no other game that plays like it other than Resident Evil 5. And Resident Evil 4 Remake feels kind of just as unique for 2023 as I think yeah. Resident Evil 4 did. It is still a very singular third-person shooter. Um, and I think, you know, to compensate for things like having movement in the game while you shoot, they've really amped up the difficulty. I don't know about you, but I'm playing it on hardcore, the highest that they yeah, allow you to I'm, start. Yeah, I'm playing it on hardcore also. And it is a really satisfying challenge. I think the game just gets better as it goes along as you sort of learn the unique things of this this combat suite and you and the challenge really pushes you to learn it. And it is a much more sort of fast, aggressive, stressful version of what Resident Evil 4 was. And just all of it as a package is so impressive on that level. Uh, it feels like this this challenging, remixed, reimagined version of this game I love. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, one of the things that's really satisfying about it is that enhanced difficulty. Like, I would recommend if people, especially if you played the demo a couple of times so you know the combat, like the new stuff they added, like the parry and things like that, um, I would recommend putting it on hardcore because it does, it is very satisfying and it pushes you to, like, really engage deeper with the combat mechanics. But the thing, one of the things the game does is it throws more enemies at you. The enemies are faster and more aggressive because you can move and you're much more mobile and they've given you these defensive mechanics like the parry. And so it's just a really, really active feeling version of the Resident Evil 4 combat. Like it really, it feels like kind of the thing, honestly, Resident Evil 5 should have done years ago, right? Like it is thinking about, okay, here's this really fantastic, very singular combat design we created for this game. Now, this genre of the third-person shooters was very heavily influenced by Resident Evil 4, but it went in a fairly different direction with Gears of War and all that kind of stuff, where it was more mobile. And I think this is a good way of thinking, how do you kind of combine those two things? How do you give players the thing that they expect, which is more mobility and more control over their character, while still retaining that kind of um, chess-like feel of that very strategic feel of the original Resident Evil 4 combat, which came from you having to make really like sh smart, immediate uh, improvisational choices about how you're tackling large groups of mostly melee focused enemies and managing crowd control and all that kind of stuff. This game has all of that with it while also giving you more kind of freedom and more options in combat, which is, I think is what a modern player is going to expect from a game like this. And that's a really huge feat. Like that to me is the most impressive thing about the remake is being able to bridge that gap so well um because it's also totally different than how the other two remakes play resident evil 2 remake um you know that game has really good combat design but it is for a very different kind of game that is trying to feel vaguely like what is it what is the combat like in those really old school resident evil games how does the combat function in a like big picture perspective in the game design for those games how do you make that work in third person um i think that those two games do that really really well um, but that is not, but that's not designed for an action game. Resident Evil 4 is an action game. Um, and so th that's the part of the game to me that just I keep on having my mind blown. Like the deeper I get in, get in, the more enemy types I see, 
the more complex enemy encounters and stuff like that that you run into, just how fully fleshed out that combat design is. Yeah, I do think it's the most impressive thing because that's honestly the thing I was most worried about because I do think the original Resident Evil 4 combat is so unique and bespoke and singular and what it does is something that, you know, even even Resident Evil 5, which largely just borrows that system intact, doesn't pull it off again because the, the design around the combat, the encounters, all of that just is not anywhere near as sort of tight and smart. And I think it, 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 there's, there's the very real risk in doing a modern remake that you could just strip out what made the game special, and they haven't. I think they've done a good job. Again, it, it definitely feels like the target audience is kind of people who played the original, because everyone played the original to some extent, uh-huh. right? Um, obviously, there will be newcomers. It is a 20-year-old game. But it does feel like it is expecting, okay, you kind of knew how this went. Let's let's really remix it. Let's rethink this. You know, every combat encounter that I've done so far is essentially based on a combat encounter in the original game, but with a lot of fun kind of twists and add-ons and added complexity. And so you're literally taking the bones of the best third-person shooter ever made and kind of opening it up and adding on to it instead of just sort of replacing what was there. And I think the way they've accomplished that is really impressive. And it means that, like, my favorite parts of this game are my favorite parts of the original, which is the big combat sandboxes, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just, but they play in a very different way. And there is something of, when I started to realize how much, like, the mobility and aggressiveness kind of play into it, and that, you know, you can be, you know, getting a headshot and walking forward as you're preparing to take the next shot, and then when you do that, you go in and do the melee, and then the knife comes out, and, like, the way all of that kind of cycle of it works, I think they've done a lot of really smart things to bring that all together and make it feel like a unique take on this classic game. And then around all of that, just the ways they've, you know, this does feel like a sequel to that Resident Evil 2 remake. It's brought in Mm -hmm. more sort of old school Resident Evil exploration and puzzle mechanics and things like that. And those are very fun to engage with. Just a a version of Resident Evil 4 that is a little less linear, a little more exploration based, um, making this feel, I think, properly like a sequel to that, you know, fantastic Resident Evil 2 remake. Yeah, because they don't go, like, crazy far with, like, you know, they're not totally redesigning the areas of the game, but there is a really fun section when you get to the end of basically what is the village area, um, where it gives you a little bit of time to go, hey, let's go back and revisit some places you've been before, and they've added in more kind of treasures and other, like, little mini puzzles and things like that that encourage you to backtrack a little bit and go find some secrets and go unlock stuff. They've added in... Um, or like really they've kind of expanded on this thing that is this very kind of like little tiny thing that happens in Resident Evil 4, which is there's this side quest with the blue medallions, which is such like a weird little, like there's, it basically happens once um, in that game and you can get the Punisher pistol or whatever. Um, whereas here they've expanded it out to feel like, oh, this is just a thing that exists across the whole game. It makes me wonder if Resident Evil 4 was originally supposed to be more like that and if that maybe got cut because that blue medallion thing is so weirdly specific um but here you have the merchant gives you occasional side quests that you can go do and a lot of them are very simple and it's just kind of like when you're exploring this area if you go off a beaten path you'll find a little extra thingy that you have to go sell to him or they've added in different blue medallions in different areas of the castle or in the village and stuff like that um and then it gives you spinals which now are a unique currency that you can use to get specific upgrades Uh, And so I think that that also is a smart change that feels very organically growing from something that was in the original game, um, but gives you some more extra stuff and also just adds uh, like a little bit more variety to the economy of the game that you have both your normal currency, but then also you have the special currency that there are specific items like the like red nine stock or the TMP stock you can only get by using the spinal currency, the treasure maps. So some of those specific items you can get with spinals. And then also there are some other ones like you can buy gems and stuff to get more money. So it adds a little bit more sort of uh, to that meta game of thinking how you're building out your character and prioritizing what upgrades in what way. Yeah, absolutely. It's all of that stuff is really doubling down on things that were already there in the original and just sort of making them better. And that's really cool because that's another area where the, you know, the merchant stuff is so weird and unique to old school Resident Evil. Um, even though like Village has something somewhat similar to it, but it's not quite the same way that like this works. 
And not only have they, like, I think faithfully replicated that, they've made it even sort of more special and singular to this version of the game. Um, and I also think it helps that this game, you know, the original Resident Evil 4 is a very linear game uh, where most of it is the, you know, third person shooting. And that's great because it is so fun. It is such a renewable resource of entertainment. That's what you want. I think the thing about this remake is that the combat is so intense, you kind of need a breather in between <laughs> some of the big rounds. And so I think having just a little bit of that extra downtime of exploring time, of uh, go around and you know explore these areas and find treasures, and none of it is as complicated as stuff in like you know Resident Evil 1 or 2, but it is it, it echoes that, and it sort of brings in some parts of that franchise DNA to, I think, make this experience a little more varied, which when the combat is kind of as breath as it is in this one i think helps a lot yeah definitely i i had that feeling as well because there are there are some combat encounters that especially if you're playing on hardcore you get to the end of you're like oh fuck i need to i, I need i need yes. a breather uh, i need to just walk around and, and look at some shit and, and sell some gyms and stuff because yeah it can get pretty intense yeah absolutely but really i think you know the the only thing so far i'm not totally sold on in the combat is the sort of like dodge mechanic which is done with sort of the crouch button and i found that very finicky i just finished the boss the the boss that is the like village elder um mm -hmm. which they've changed quite a bit from how that boss it, the basics of it are the same but it's the mechanics of it are quite different from the original game and i found that stuff a little finicky and when i finally beat that boss it felt a little random <laughs> like i kind of lucked my way through it um but other than that i think all of it has snapped into place really well and i'm so excited to get into the castle where a lot of my favorite stuff in resident evil 4 is yeah the dodge mechanic it took me a while to get used to because i think it's the one place where it it functions actually a lot closer to the original game than i think you expect i think you're kind of like we're so conditioned on dodge rolls that, that yes. when that happens you're thinking like oh it's gonna i need to do a dark soul style dodge roll because it's also on the same button um, when in matter of fact, that mechanic is effectively the same as the quick time dodge from the original game. So you just need to like press the button and like, don't worry about it. Like, don't you're not moving. You're not doing anything else. You just tap the button and he ducks and he will or he will for specific enemies that will trigger like a context specific action where he will dodge that specific attack. Because, yes, I was having trouble with that for a while before I wrapped my head around the, how is that mechanic actually working? And it is basically the way that the dodge worked in the original game where it is a context specific thing it is not a sort of like normal combat move you have like the parry or something um right yeah i agree that that is a little bit funky uh are you playing with the um japanese vo fuck yes i am yeah and jesus it's good yeah, yeah it's really good we talked about this when we talked about the demo but you know that the english voice acting didn't feel like it captured the energy that you're looking for from resident evil 4 um and that the they really like went for it with the japanese cast for this game and yeah having played now like seven or eight hours of the game with the japanese vo i think that is the right choice if people are inclined again i normally would say that resident evil you want to go english and there is some funkiness of like the lip flaps and stuff don't match like it's clearly like designed for the english vo first but the cast is so good and they're giving the kind of performance you think you want. It's a little bit more heightened. Um, they're not really going for like a more naturalistic delivery style, which is what the English VO is generally going for. And here, like Morikawa in particular, who plays Leon, just captures the cool guy action movie Leon vibe incredibly well. In particular, I think my favorite line he has is in the scene you were alluding to earlier where the Chainsaw Sisters show up, like in the original game that that encounters um remixed in interesting ways but when they show up he has this line where he says oh lady no motenashika where it's like oh it's like do i have to go like please the ladies now uh and it's a very good like action movie line that he has and just i feel like the deeper i get into the game the more quippy leon becomes um even in like the japanese text um because he's a, he's less sarcastic in the japanese text even in the original game if you look at the subtitles for that original um, he doesn't have as many puns or whatever that he does in the English, but he's he gets a little bit more of that energy. I think as the game gets more ridiculous, he's like Leon starts dialing up the like action movie dialogue stuff, um, which is great. But in particular, the best part of the Japanese VO is Shigeru Chiba as the merchant is fucking amazing. It's, uh, it's so unreal. good. 
Yeah, if you're uh, wondering, because, did they get Shigeru Chiba to do the Shigeru Chiba thing as the merchant? Yes, they did. And he brings 100% of the weird Shigeru Chiba energy. Uh, it basically sounds like an old Emperor Pilaf, and it is glorious. Yeah, and the merchant has a lot more dialogue in this game. You know, he has yeah. like 12 lines or whatever he says in the original, um, and everybody knows exactly what those lines are because he says them over and over. Whereas here, because they've given all these like side quests and stuff, they've just given him more to say. They've You've got like the shooting galleries are back, and he's got a bunch of voice dialogue in there as well. So the mer merchant is just a more kind of active vocal character. I mean, he's a little bit more kind of like, upbeat as well um at least with the japanese vo and there's something about that energy that is incredibly fun and every time i stumble upon the merchant it is not the same i don't have like the same feeling towards him in this as i do in the resident evil 4 the original resident evil 4 like it kind of feels like it's a different character but they're but it's still fucking great like it is a great version of this weird merchant dude who just appears out of nowhere has no business being here is never explained in any way shape or form who he is or what he's doing or how he has all these setups um and it's just <laughs> it, he it is just what it is it's the most video gamey thing in resident evil 4 is that weird merchant guy uh and it's fucking great here too yeah they absolutely nailed it you know, I think, because you're right, I think the Japanese script, it's interesting to compare if you can, you know, understand any Japanese. It is quite a bit more subdued than the English writing early on, and then Leon in particular gets a little more heightened as it goes along. You know, just down to like, they're not doing in his conversations with Hunnigan in English, it's like Eagle One and Baby Eagle and all this stuff, and Condor. I don't, that's not in the Japanese, basically. Yeah, the um, only one of those is his code name is still Condor One, but the, all right. the other code all names the others, are cut yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, they're just calling Ashley like Kanojo, like the girl, um, that sort of thing. And so it is a little more subdued. And I do think like overall playing it in Japanese, I do like the tone this version has hit upon where I think it's a fun reimagining of Resident Evil 4 from the like silly, almost like madcap Mel Brooks degree of parody B-movie for the original GameCube game um, and just every other console that's been put out on, but like the original Resident Evil 4, this one is like it's darker it's grittier it's got more sort of of a horror vibe when you know the the boss i was talking about the village elder when he goes full bug person it is like creepy and gory and crazy you know leon's death animations are much more violent so like tonally it is a little more in line with what you're getting in like the resident evil 2 remake but still trying to keep in some of that heightened humor and I think particularly the Japanese voice actors and the, the script there really nails, I think, that balancing act of making this kind of a more fleshed out version of the story that is a little closer to some of the like earlier Resident Evil horror roots, um, but still having some of the fun and zaniness that is kind of, you know, endemic to this game that is Resident Evil 4. Uh, and like just reading the English subtitles as I'm playing along, it is. I do think the English script is frequently quite weird and where it keep, decides to like keep one-liners where I think in this version of the game they don't really fit, like Leon's bingo line at the beginning, which is not there in Japanese, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Where, but, but in playing in Japanese with these actors, just I do think I'm really having fun with how they've sort of expanded and fleshed out the story and the tone and the atmosphere. Um, you know, Kenshiro Suda as Luis is just fantastic. Uh, everyone is, is great. Yeah, and I particularly like um, Kito Akari, who plays Ashley. Uh, she does a really good job. I, I really like Ashley overall. Like, it feels like they have made her feel like a college student. It was always one of those things in the original Resident Evil 4, where she's t technically supposed to be, like, 21 or 22 or something. Like, you see it in her file. But she always read to me like she was supposed to be 17 years old in that original right. game. She always seems like she's supposed to be younger than what she technically is in the story. And I just think they kind of hit with this character. She feels more like... You know, she's younger than Leon, but not like a kid kid. Um, but she is a little bit more naive or whatever. You know, she's not, you know, she's not a super secret agent or whatever. So she's not used to dealing with this kind of crazy zombie bullshit. Um, but she's, but she feels a little bit more capable. And the script doesn't sexualize her as much, right? You don't have the like, oh, the president equipped his daughter with ballistics. Like that line's not there in either <laughs> version. Um, yes. I don't think that line was actually ever there in, in Japanese. I mean, in terms of the pun, I don't think it was there. Um, but yeah, so so I think like they do a better job with Ashley um, making it a more modern version of that character than the kind of very mid-2000s girl in a video game thing is what you had in the original game. 
Yeah. Like Luis also is quite a bit expanded as a character, which Mm -hmm. makes sense because he is such a weird sort of vestigial part of the original Resident Evil 4, which is part of the fun. But again, if you're going to do it like this and you're going to have this level of like visual fidelity and everything, I think they've had a fun job bringing the story into something that feels like a 2023 video game while still feeling like Resident Evil and like Resident Evil 4 in particular. And I'm excited to see what the heck they do with the castle and some of the... Because I have not gotten to where the original game gets crazy yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. It starts out pretty crazy, but it doesn't really get crazy until you get to the castle. So I am very excited to see how they handle all of that. Even like the little moments with Ada so far, I've enjoyed. So, yeah. I I mean, it's also, I think one of the things that has surprised me most about it so far is that like not only did this not cut content really, like Resident Evil 3 Remake cut quite a bit from the original Resident Evil 3 and wound up being a very short game. Um, This is like longer than Resident Evil 4 so Mm -hmm. far. Like all of the areas have been fleshed out. There's that whole section in Chapter 4 that you were alluding to earlier, Sean, where you get in the boat and you can go around and do some some of these objectives kind of however you want and that adds a lot to the game. Uh, So it is, It's if anything, it's a longer, more fleshed out experience which is not usually what you would see today and that's pretty cool to see. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Yeah, so far the section I've done in the castle has had the same kind of thing of where you're recognizing like okay yeah this is this area this is this encounter but then yeah but then oh this area is a little bit expanded or they add a little bit more here or they remixed up how this has gone so yeah it's a it's a fun interesting approach for remaking this game which i think we talked a lot about in the lead up to this like how kind of insane of a task it is trying to remake resident evil 4 and it's incredible to me how thoroughly excellent a job they have done yeah, it just, it, it very self-evidently feels like a companion to the original game, not a replacement. And I think that's mm-hmm. part of why I think it works so well, is it's not really trying to do the kind of video game remake thing of like, this is the new definitive version. It really feels like these kind of sit on the shelf together. Uh, and that's really cool to see. You know, I think that, and I think that's true of like their two remake as well, um, mm-hmm. which is in this vein. And man, this team, because this is the Resident Evil 3 remake was a separate team, but this is the same team that did two. This team is so talented. If they ever do what they are destined to do and get their fucking hands on Code Veronica, that is going to be like an all time great video game. But at the same time, I have to admit, this is also kind of making me want a Resident Evil 5 remake. Mm -hmm. Uh, As crazy as that sounds, 5 does have good stuff in it. And I I keep thinking, like, man, these mechanics with what 5 was trying to do, particularly if you figure out how to bring the co-op into it, that could be something really special. I mean, that whole section in in the 4 remake where you're on the boat going around the lake, that's a part of Resident Evil 5, Mm -hmm. where you have this long section on a boat and you have, like, a series of objectives that you can sort of do in any order. And that's one of the best parts of 5. And I, I don't know, we're, we're reaching the point where they're going to hit this fucking singularity if they keep remaking these. It's kind of like Pokemon where they're inching up towards the point where you're just remaking the brand new games. But uh, I don't know, five, five might be a fun one to do in this style. Yeah, I've, I've, I would be down for it. I think it would be harder to do because there's stuff about five you know, with like the setting and Shiva yes. and stuff that like you got to really think pretty fucking hard about how you are updating that uh, because yes. that was stuff that uh, was did not fly when that game originally came out, um, let no. alone now. So that would uh, be the biggest challenge. But yeah. like it's also, you know, you could also do like, I don't know, do Shiva more justice this time. Figure out how mm-hmm. like you can make her an interesting character, you know, like. It, just because it's set in Africa doesn't mean it has to be a racist mess. <laughs> you know, um, there's there's ways you could rework it. I don't, it would not necessarily be my first choice. I do think it's, it still remains weird to me that they skipped over Code Veronica. I know it does not have a number on it. It is the actual Resident Evil 3. Resident Evil 3 is really more of a spin-off side game. Uh, and so it does feel like we kind of, if you know the original kind of progression, like we skipped a step here. But uh, yeah, this is so much better than I was expecting and it is an absolute blast so far. I can't wait to play more. Yes, I'm, I'm itching to get back. Uh, I, it is like the thing I when I got up this morning, I was like, I'm going to go play some more Resident Evil 4 Remake before we <laughs> yep. do the podcast. Uh, yeah, because it's, yeah, it's just a great game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, fun on the PS5, I enjoy how they are using the DualSense. I, mm-hmm. I know they did that on Village, but I didn't play Village on PS5. But they the, the way they use the triggers and the haptics has been very entertaining so far. 
yeah, yeah, they definitely do a good job of making use of the PS5 features and everything. Um, yeah, like I, I will echo what I said at the end of the demo or conversation we had in last week's podcast. People didn't hear that. If you're playing on PS5, make sure you turn off chromatic aberration because that option is still glitched and it makes the game um, look blurry as shit and it makes the game look bad. I think like the game, it could like, I think there's still an issue with how they're up their image. And so it is still not as high an level image quality as you really want but overall the game still looks really nice and has great art design um but if you have that chromatic aberration feature on it's just fucks the whole thing up and then also i strongly recommend putting the uh camera acceleration controls basically at max and then increasing some of the the default camera speed um so that way you're getting a much more responsive game because the game is very sluggish by its default camera settings um so if people have either haven't done that yet or haven't played the game yet that would be my recommendation of how to set up the game to have a better time yes i would agree with all of that uh it is i do hope this gets a patch for some of the image quality issues soon because a lot of it is very impressive but there are these weird little issues that players should not have to be on the lookout for especially Mm -hmm. on the fucking ps5 with how much that system can do and i feel like it's not being fully utilized with some of the image you know like it's basically like 4k reconstruction stuff is just not working perfectly but overall it is still uh, impressive especially if you get the the settings right so yes and and i would also recommend people put it leave it on the default frame rate mode do not turn on ray tracing don't turn on their weird hair thing or whatever because both of those are not well implemented features and they just hurt the frame rate and the frame rate's yeah. very good it's not like a perfect 60 you can definitely feel it drop a little bit in places when it gets a bit more hectic um but generally if you just leave it on the vanilla frame rate road it runs well yes it does all right so that is resident evil 4 now let's talk about john wick chapter 4 new movie that we can talk about in its totality because we have seen it Uh, So spoilers from here on out. If you have not yet seen John Wick Chapter 4, only thing I will say to you if you haven't is what what the fuck are you doing listening to this podcast? Go see John Wick Chapter 4. It is, uh, it's, you you owe it to yourself. It's just that good a movie. Come on. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's fucking great. Um, Obviously, you should see the other John Wicks first. If you haven't seen the other John Wicks, uh, you should check those out too because they're all really good. But yeah, this this is a kick-ass film it's it really i don't even know where to start with this movie sean Mm -hmm. it kind of boggles the mind like i was super excited for this movie because it is john wick and you all know how much i love john wick i i was there opening day of the original movie not many people even saw that one in theaters i've been i'm an og john wick fan uh so i've always been excited for these but like i don't know there's not a lot of movie franchises that peak with their fourth movie Mm. And I think there was like, I just, there was a question for me of like the leap from one to two was so big. And then three, I don't, I think you can debate whether two or three are better, but three like definitely kept that going and did a lot of amazing new things. And it's just like, man, can they do it again? Not only can they do it again, but it's like four is like just clearly hands down the best one. Yeah. And just clearly hands down one of the best action movies ever made. It is, and I think goes beyond, like this is how I opened my little review I wrote of this film. Uh, is that like just saying like man this is one of the best action movies ever does to me weirdly feel like underselling what it has accomplished not because like it like again I think action films are great I don't think there should be any like genre judgment going on there when I say that but it does feel like I'm putting it in a box and like no full on I think when you look at the cinematography and the production design and the choreography and the editing and the acting and the physicality of this movie, all the things that go into making a great movie, this movie is executing at a level that just movies in general Mm -hmm. do not execute at very often in the history of cinema. It is a special thing that exists. And I think you get to the end of it. It is such a complete package. It, It is three hours, but it flows so beautifully um like again i do think there's something that is just a little bit of like underselling it just to say it's a great action movie i think it's just a great fucking movie yeah absolutely i mean one of the things that this movie does i think kind of structurally and tonally is it pushes it a little bit out of the like kind of um kung fu adjacent action movie thing which is very much the tone of the first three movies and pushes this one more into like it feels more like it's an epic is sort of the tone it's going for Because while it is easily the longest of them, it doesn't feel like it's the longest because it has the most action. 
Um, it because it feels like where they've filled that space is by narratively expanding the film really dramatically. Um, like you know, the director Chad Stahelski has said multiple times in interviews that I've seen that like one of the big influences on the movie was the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, which is an epic western, right? Um, and that movie has its three protagonist structure. Um, with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, or arguably, it is one protagonist with two co-protagonists, with the protagonist being ugly, not good. Um, but th- <laughs> uh, this is kind of borrowing a little bit of that. It's not the exact same plot or anything, um, but is doing the... We have generally three main characters. You've got John Wick, you've got Kane, Don Yen's character, and you've got Mr. Nobody. Um, and it is much, I mean, you know, John Wick 3 definitely was fairly globetrotting. John Wick 2 had its whole section in Italy. Um, but this feels more like this is a big globetrotting adventure. We've got this bigger cast of characters we're focusing on. It's a much bigger, more epic tone. It's going for huge, big spaces. Um, you're getting less of the kind of more claustrophobic action sequences that was, um, I think what you normally associated with John Wick 1, 2, and 3 is lots of fighting in really close quarters and really tight areas and using that to your advantage and particularly the whole ending sequence of this movie you're in like big open areas and using that expanse um both for the action but also cinematically for the look of the movie that it just pushes it to this very different place which is really satisfying um because it feels like it gives everybody involved with this movie from obviously the direction from the like set design to the choreography to the like cinematography and the visuals to the acting everything feels like it gets to be put on a much bigger stage which is what all these people are so fucking good at and i think being able to push out and expand the boundaries of everything so much really suits the talents of all the people involved and it's what to me like makes it feel like this is kind of the inevitable point that the john wick franchise needed to reach to because it's always had this kind of mythic undertone throughout all the movies. It's one of the things that made the setting of the original really kind of unique and interesting and sets it apart amongst other kind of revenge action movies. And this puts that kind of mythic undertone and makes it less of an undertone. And it's just the tone of the film. Uh, And that was just the thing that I kind of knew was going to be a part of it based on what I heard from the buzz. But I don't think I realized how effective that would be at really changing the feel of this film when I went to go see it. Yeah, I think that's a really good description. And, you know, part of that too is just, even if John Wick did not die at the end of this movie, this does feel like the last movie just by dint of how big it gets. Like all of the Mm -hmm. stuff you're talking about, Sean, it feels like the culmination. Like this is the place this series ultimately needed to go. It does a little bit of every kind of action the series has done up to now usually on a much bigger scale. And then it does a bunch of action the series has never quite even dreamed of to date, you know? And it is going to all of these places and it is involving, you know, all parts of the world of John Wick, the crazy, silly, mythical world. And just, you know, reaching this operatic tone where I think even if the story were not setting itself up to be the ending, which it pretty definitively is, like, you would still feel this sense of this is such a culmination You know, an hour into this movie, I was sold on the idea of this being the last one, not in the sense of like, they're out of steam, they're clearly not out of steam, but on a let's go out on fucking top, this is a movie going out like very self-consciously on top. Yeah, I think this, yeah, this feels like a movie that knows that like, there is only so many of these that you can really make, at least like with this fundamental setup, right? Like, is eventually narratively, you just start going in such a circle of... I'm getting out, but then I'm pulled back in. I'm getting out. I'm getting pulled back in. Um, whereas this, I think, helps land the series on a really definitive note that it's like, you know, technically, obviously, they could do another one if they want to. Um, I don't. I would much prefer if they don't try to bring John Wick back in some kind of way. Um, you can do like spinoffs, and that would be cool. Uh, but this, it feels like they found a good beat to end this with, with this character without letting it get repetitive, um, which is the thing that I think is really important about how it feels about this movie being the culmination in the ending point is it feels like you're getting a good sort of like, um, redux of those great action beats they've done before. You know, they bring the fucking dog shit from three back, which is awesome. And one of the best parts of that movie, um, and all that kind of stuff. And then it finds a really graceful note to arrive at for the character, 
that it feels like this is what you want. Um, it, I think it would be disappointing if this these if you were on a John Wick eight and it was still. I'm trying to get out and then something pulls me back in and I have to start killing a bunch of people begrudgingly. Um, there's only so many times you can do that plot. And I think this like figures out this is like where you have to be at the end and, and stop it. Well, I think, you know, this does something in its script because I do think the story of this movie is really smart. And I think yeah. probably the best storytelling this series has had. And I think the series has always had really good storytelling. Um, so that's not putting down the other movies. But I think this movie sort of like takes the question that I'm pre I would guess the filmmakers are just asking themselves of like, well, what are we doing with this? Right? Like John Wick is asked that directly by Hiroyuki Sawada's character and uh, Donnie Yen's character and other characters throughout the movie of like, like, where are you going with this? Like, you've killed a lot of people. Now you're aiming at the high table. Like, what's the end goal here? You can't kill everybody, right? Uh, and I, I question the premise. I think John Wick maybe can kill everybody. But that aside, there is a legitimate question of like, well, what is the kind of goal here? And I think it's very smart to just take that question and bring it into the text of the movie and make that John Wick's journey here where there, over the course of the movie, there is this kind of existential angst and he does find something to fight for by the end and something is like achieved in you know being able to help redeem the Donnie Yen character and save his daughter you know humble the high table and then also get a good death out of it because I certainly can't imagine a version of John Wick that ends with him walking off happily into the sunset mm -hmm. uh, I think this is the right ending for him and so I think doing all of that and and you know bringing that question sort of to the fore of the film's themes is smart and you know I think the movies have done a pretty good job of not keeping the story repetitive so far you know like one and two both sort of start with him coming back in after he thought he had gotten out. But then I think two, three, four, I like the flow of two and three both sort of end on this cliffhanger kicking us off into the next one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you could not, if four also ended on a cliffhanger, that would be weird. And I think this one feels like a very natural wrap up to the story that was effectively started in John Wick 2, but ideas that have been there since John Wick 1. Yeah, because I do think like they basically had two choices to end this well which was either to end it at the end of john wick 2 um where he's running away um i rewatched all these movies before four came out and so all that's yeah. very fresh which i would recommend people do also just because those movies are really good and it does like the storytelling is so good and smooth across the whole series that it is fun to watch them in quick succession but you know at the, the end of two has this fantastic ending where you know he's killed the guy in the continental it's he's been made excommunicado and he's on the run um, as he sees that like everybody around him is an assassin waiting and chomping at the bit to get one on John Wick. And if they had stopped after that, that would have been a good ending that would have completely implied that John Wick gets fucking killed after that. Like that's like so much where that ending feels like it is heading at the end of two, which I thought was striking when I rewatched it because I forgot how like dour the tone is in many ways that they didn't have like mortal the tone is there. Um, and then John Wick 3 is much more of a, okay, this is, you are leading directly into a sequel. Like, two, you can make a sequel of what happens after that movie ends, and how does he deal with those assassins. But also the way that that ending is shot, it feels like they knew, hey, well, this might be the last one. We don't know if, like, for sure if this is going to be a thing that can go well, on forever. Yeah, the first one did good at the box office, but it didn't, like, light the world on fire. I mean, the first movie made uh, about as much money like Lifetime in the U.S. as John Wick 4 made in its first day. Like, it mm -hmm. just was not, it didn't light the world on fire. It got, it did bigger on home video. This got a sequel greenlit. And so I think there was a question, like, if the sequel does well, we'll get to make more. But this might be our last at-bat. And I think you're right. Then, then once ja John Wick 2 had kind of the, like, it just, there was this exponential growth. Of course, they can keep doing these. And I think you're right. 3 was much more consciously made with a series in mind. Yeah, and so I think there's just, you know, I think what was smart was for them to say, then let's just take the one after that and end it there. Like, because I do think that they have reached the point where they have, you know, they went to the the top in three, like he meets the elder or whatever, um, and all that kind of stuff. And it feels like they're, they pushed against the boundaries of how far they can go. Um, and so it's smart to end here. And I also think it's appropriate that they end, 
you know, effectively with with John's death, because that is kind of what the series has always been about is him running against death and fighting against mortality. Um, that's something that like was put more into perspective for me when I rewatched all the other ones is that's like so much the theme of these movies is both it's the death of his wife slash the death of his dog, but it's also like his inevitable death. It's like, what? how does he keep going on? What does he try to live for in this world? And he keeps on making mistakes that push him deeper, deeper and deeper into the, the underworld, both literally the underworld of assassins, but like metaphorically the underworld of this whole thing that is meant to be metaphorically Hades or whatever, right? Uh, the concierge character, Lance Reddick's character is named Charon, the fairy man of the river Styx for a reason, right? So that mortality theme has always been there. And so it does feel really satisfying to see it come to fruition here rather than trying to milk it forever. And that was just something at the end of the movie. I just like appreciated how they have structured this story, whether they knew that they were going to get sequels along the way or not. They have found a really smooth way to connect everything together into what feels like the John Wick saga or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with the expanded sort of good, the bad, and the ugly structure that John Wick 4 has given us, it's not just that he does die and confront his mortality, but they've built a story around that where it does not... I mean, there's a melancholy to the ending. This is a sort of sadder movie in a lot of ways than the first three, but it does not strictly feel like a, a bad ending for John Wick to me in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, this does feel like he worked through something and he, you know, there's the line that was in the trailers for this movie and it's in, in the film itself too that I think Hiroyuki uh, Sawada's character has of like a good death comes at the end of a good life and John Wick finds something uh, actually like worth dying for in, in that is not sort of his wife and his dog and that thing and like sort of helping to redeem the Donnie Yen character and all of that. And I think the specific scenario that they do everything with here just, yeah, it, it, what a perfect sort of like four part series this thing has become. And that is really amazing, especially when you consider that first movie is so, you know, was low budget and small mm -hmm. scale and word of mouth and all of that. And now it's fucking this American epic that has become John Wick four. That is like truly one of the most epic movies that I think Hollywood has produced in our lifetimes. Yeah, it is. It is like a crazy thing. These films, like then this whole, the fact that it is a franchise at all is pretty insane and that it's not really like franchise of you could see an alternate universe where you got john wick um and it had its very modest theatrical run and but then it does really well on home video and so they if this was like the 80s or the 90s they then would have made the direct to video sequel where it's not even keanu reeves it's some other dude yes. <laughs> who's john wick you know um in like steven seagal is fucking the bad guy or some shit um, and, th and that's what John Wick 2 was. And they never, either they never made another one or they made like 20 of them somehow. And somehow like they're still making new weird John Wick movies that have no connection to the original <laughs> one that is actually good. Um, it feels like it so could have been that franchise in some alternate universe rather than being this thing where they have just progressively, um, sort of like pushed the boundaries and made it bigger and better and more interesting until you reach John Wick chapter four, which feels like it just sort of transcends the quality of all the other movies. Yeah. And I mean, it is, it's a franchise that exists purely on its own quality and word of mouth. Like yeah. this is not a franchise that had IP. It it's, you know, it has big movie names in it, but like Keanu Reeves, certainly when the first one came out, was in a period of his career where you, I don't think he was considered like the Hollywood leading man who like could drive ticket sales. Uh, now he very much is because yes. of John Wick, but like that kind of came back into fashion. It does not have any of the things that make franchises in Hollywood today. What it has is it's really, really, really fucking good and people love it and they talk about it. And there is something so deeply, profoundly refreshing about that. Uh, and man, I, I love these movies and I love this one in particular. By God, what a what a special journey! <laughs> yeah. So so let's let's dive into talking about the movie like itself. Where do you want to start, Jonathan? God, there's a lot. There's a lot of places. That's a big question. The movie basically. I mean, one thing to say is that it is three hours. It's paced beautifully. Like I think it oh, might yeah. be the best paced John Wick movie. Like I think mm -hmm. before I would have said two was probably the best overall and the best paced. Like two, yeah. when you basically from the moment um, he kills the woman, D'Antonia in like the bathtub scene, 
and he leaves that room, it is just one basically extended series of action sequences to the end of the movie, and that movie is amazingly paced. And then I think four, it's bigger and it's more epic, but there is something about it that the way it's strung together does not feel long to me. Uh, it's it's extremely well done, and it does have this kind of three-act structure of the section in Osaka, the section in Germany, and then the section in France. And each of them is doing something fairly unique, but there is not the same kind of like episodic quality that I think you would say three has. And I love three. I think three is a great, great movie as well, Mm -hmm. but it is a little more choppy in how it's put together. Yeah. I think that is one of the things I love about this movie is it is definitely the best pace. Cause I think all the other John Wick movies, having just rewatched them, there are a couple of movies moments over those movies where you feel the pace hitch a little bit as they're trying to sort of like figure out how to transition into the next set piece, you know, not in a way that's like awful or anything. It's just a very common thing you get in lots of action movies because it's part of how they're made is they're also trying to think through practically speaking, what kind of set pieces can we do? What do we want to do? What is like the stunt team want to try out? And it's like, how do you tie all those together? Um, Sometimes that means that the script or the story is going to have weird junction points where it's trying to figure out how to get all those action beats to run together. Whereas here, it feels completely seamless. Like, you know, it is built, as you said, around three major set pieces, the Osaka section at the beginning, the Germany section in the middle, the Paris section at the end, all three of those sequences also like are used to like push and develop our characters in different ways, right? So it's like you introduce all three of our main characters in that first section and have them all kind of confront each other in Osaka with their like allegiances and what they're trying to do is all confused. They then split up. You see each of them develop a little bit more. You come back together in Germany where they're all thrown together um, opposite the uh, Scott Adkins bad guy. Um, And they have to sort of like cooperate with each other while also trying to figure out where do we all fall? And then they split up again, develop on their own and then come back together in Paris where they're combative. And this is where they like all fight each other, but then ultimately come together as like they are all on the same side. They're all fighting against the same kind of um, sort of power structure. Uh, They're all just have been trying to do it in their own way or they've all been like abused by it in their own way and they come together together in the end and they're all on the same side um and that's not even necessarily that they're all on the same side and that like they all three of them team up together to fight the big bad guy it's more like narratively they all realize we are you know of a, come from a common place and there's something that's very nice about that that the ending point isn't necessarily about these three characters in a very hackneyed way like teaming up or whatever it's more like philosophically and spiritually you feel they have all gone on this journey across those three big set pieces and arrived where they are all like symbolically brothers yeah it's so archetypally smart this is where like i think chad stahelski has put his money where his mouth is on the sergio leone comparisons of Mm -hmm. like you know the ending being that you have donnie yen and john wick in a full-on pistols at dawn standoff Uh, but they are effectively still on the same team. This is like friends figuring out how to get through this Pistols at Dawn standoff, right? Yeah. Uh, And kill the real big bad. And then you have Mr. Nobody being the guy who has sort of settled into being the man on the side, witnessing the myth of John Wick, and presumably then going out and talking to the world about it is kind of, I feel Mm -hmm. like, the sort of Western archetype you're getting there as well. So, yeah, I think just, yeah, that structure is so smart, and I think it gives us a good way to kind of break this down, because that initial Osaka section, like, that is the best John Wick movie on its own, just like Mm -hmm. that first hour. It is what they do in the big Osaka set piece, uh, not just in terms of the action itself, but I think the cinematography and the use of color and lighting. These are all things, to be clear, that the John Wick movies have done phenomenally well over time. Particularly, I think the big leap from one to two is what they do with production design and cinematography, and then three continues that, and then this one dials it up to 11, uh, because there are shots here that I just can't believe exist, and so much of it is just down to the basics of lighting and blocking and shooting, Um, but it is executed at such a high level, and And, like, for this movie, for that to be its first hour is where you know you're watching an all-timer. Yeah, it's, yeah, all the stuff in the Osaka Continental is amazing. Um, One, it's just very satisfying also to hear a bunch of people speaking Japanese that actually speak Japanese. Like, is the guy in John Wick Chapter (laughs) 3 who has some Japanese lines is not a native Japanese speaker. And if you know Japanese, you can very easily tell, uh, which is, like, not a big deal. But it, it does, it's, like, a little bit annoying. Um, but there's there's a very satisfying like 
this is a hotel run by the Yakuza vibes you get, right? That like all the stuff in the back rooms with dudes like chowing down on ramen and whatever. And when Hiroyuki Sanada comes in, it's like, we've got guests like, you know, prepare for them. Um, and they're all like, hike and they all get their shit. Um, I don't know, it's just like the vibe is really, really strong. Um, this is also where you just get how incredible they've pushed like both the production design and also like the costume design in this movie yes. is fucking amazing. Hiroyuki Sanada's get up in this movie is the coolest fucking look. This it's like a it, it's like if you fused a kimono and a suit like a western suit together into one outfit it almost reminds me of like uh ayato from genshin impact in a weird way um not the coloring but just like the design of the outfit where he's sort of like combined eastern and western aesthetics in his fashion it's such a cool fucking look and then his daughter as well um but like everything there you just feel how lavish and interesting the production design is and as you said it's something that these movies have always done well particularly with like two on where they really pushed that element uh, but here, it's just at a fucking another level how good everything is and how interesting and how distinct it is. It's like you just have never seen a movie that quite looks like this, that has costumes like this, that has set design that looks quite like this, that uses lighting quite like this. It's so cool. Yes. I mean, that to me is the thing that I think, like, above everything else, the secret sauce of John Wick might genuinely be its production design and lighting. And I know that sounds weird to say, because this is a movie where we all talk about the fights. And the fights are unbelievably well done. But, you know, I've seen a lot of action movies with great fights, like, including with people in this movie, like Donnie Yen and whatnot, right? Um, I do think the John Wick movies must be near or, like, at the apotheosis of how good movies like this look. Like, there is something about... And I particularly Ford does this, but I think they've really, you know, chapter one, which, you know, remember is like the kind of low budget one, does have that one big scene in the club in the mm -hmm. middle that is like the John Wick scene that is has this kind of production design and cinematography and everything else in that movie is a little flatter and more cheap because it was made for like $15 million. But since they've had more money to work with, they so clearly put it on screen in the sets, in the environments they have the characters fight in. You know, two has that amazing, like Italian concert area that is in these caves and the bath where his target you know slits her wrists and it's like this you know high gothic painting or something and then there's the whole fight in the catacombs and at the end of two you have the hall of mirrors film three has the fucking library and the knife museum and then it has that area under the New York continental where there's all the, the what I think of as the Jackie Chan glass for everyone to break uh -huh. um, and that is amazing and it's got all those like video LED walls putting lights everywhere and then this movie it's just everything like even saying the osaka area it's like 10 different sets you've yeah. got all these places within the osaka continental that are the the big wide open spaces you were talking about earlier sean where they're fighting but even the scene where hiroyuki sonata dies where he he fights donnie Yen and dies it's like five minutes of the movie and they built this giant like sort of japanese pond area but so it's like kind of like a traditional area but then it's got the high-tech architecture around it and that is like just a couple of shots that they built this incredible bespoke location for and it just continues all throughout the movie with berlin and france and everything and i do think that is what sets this apart because you know it, it really hammers home for me how fucking grossly lazy you know movies like the marvel films are in just we'll just shoot it all on a green screen and add in bad blurry stuff later i guess um because like this movie costs half as much as of any of those and they just build set after set after set that looks amazing and then i think what they do with lighting and color and cinematography and and the way shots are you know framed and lit my favorite shot in this movie might be that one of john standing under the big fucking cherry blossom tree as the red mm -hmm. light comes on and it's just this incredible like kind of old west shot of john wick contemplating his existence in the lower right of the frame but it's with this traditional japanese cherry tree and this weird red leon neon lighting that to me is like the quintessential john wick shot uh, but this movie is full of them yeah and it's yeah it's just you get such a a feast right off the bat with the sasaka stuff especially because you know it very consciously is also mirroring the ending of three right where you also had the giant action scene in the new york continental 
at the ending of three. And so they, you see that like there is a similar back room in the Osaka Continental, like from the end of three with like all the glass cubes and stuff um, for people to get thrown through. They've got the guys with the body armor from three show up or like it's the same kind of body armor that they have. And so you're having to do that kind of thing of where trying to figure out how do we kill these guys how do we get through their armor which really like motivates like the cool judo throws combined with gun stuff that you get the kind of vaguely gun foo thing um it's 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 where you also get that aspect of the movie i guess where you feel them thinking about what are the major kinds of things kinds of action beats that we've had in the previous three movies how do we sort of bring those back but add something new and add a different element to it um, and part of that here is like, you just see how much more capable John Wick is now at taking care out the armor guys. Cause he just sort of, you know, it takes a while cause it takes a while to take them down, but he manhandles these motherfuckers, whereas it was a really hard fight for him in three. Um, but then also I just think all the, the character dynamics that are happening here with Hiroyuki Sanada having that character, having a, a history with John Wick, um, in this like deeper level of friendship that exists outside the confines of the assassin society which is how his relationships with most people are all framed right clearly that's his you know he and winston like have a good friendship or whatever most of the time and you feel that there is a lot of trust between them but there you also very much understand compared to the hiroyuki sanada character their relationship is entirely through the framework of this business they are like colleagues first um, whereas Hiroki Sanada's character is a friend with John Wick and cares about him on that level. And so you're introducing that kind of theme in this like much kind of sharper and more um, emotional core to the relationships at the heart of this movie, especially then when Kane comes in. And so you have this dynamic of these three old friends who now must fight because of what John Wick has done. Yeah. And you have, so yeah, you have them, you have the Hiroyuki Sonata character, you have Donnie Yen's Kane, you have Rina Sawayama, who plays the daughter of Koji Akira. Um, she has a whole part here, and you have Mr. Nobody introduced here. So yeah, it's not just that you have this amazing action and sets and everything. There is like a full character story being told here. Um, and I want to talk about some of those characters and some of the action things they're doing here. But also, we're, we're too deep into this conversation to have not had the talk yet. Sean... Donnie Yen in this movie. Uh -huh. Go off. T tell us about how cool it is. <laughs> I mean, it's the best part of this movie uh, is Donnie Yen. Uh, like, I'm not exaggerating that. Like, I think that is the thing that makes this movie work really fundamentally is that they have found someone who can be a co-star in a John Wick movie. Like, in a, like both in a narrative sense, they've found a good character, but then also in, like, a physical sense. Um, they this, this is the first time that Hollywood has known what the fuck to do with Donnie Yen. Um, yes. It has been like, as someone who is a big fan of Donnie Yen's stuff from Hong Kong, it has always been really frustrating to me whenever he gets like a part in an American movie, um, how little they typically understand how to use him. With like the biggest example of that being Rogue One, a Star Wars story, where it is just the most like thrown off use of him I've ever seen. They give him, you know, it's funny to, to compare it with John Wick Chapter 4, where they both give him the same kind of um, blind Asian martial arts master thing, but they give him so much more, much a much richer character to play here, who has richer relationships and has much more time to explore them. Um, I mean, that's the problem with Rogue One across the board, is none of the characters have time to explore their like relationships, but it comes off worse for the Donnie Yen character because it feels like they're leaning more on a trope as a result of that. But then the worst part is that, like, when it comes to the action, they have no idea what to do with them. They have no idea how do you use a guy who, like, actually knows what he's doing. How do you film action for someone who can move so fast you, you can't capture him on fucking camera, basically, right? You can punch someone so fast that the camera barely can even see it. Um, and how do you how do you shoot action with a guy who knows how to shoot action better than your director does? Because sorry, but John Dunyan just fucking does. He does. He knows how to do and shoot and choreograph action better than almost anybody on the fucking planet. Um, so when you see him in those movies, if you know him from his Hong Kong stuff, it's just incredibly disappointing because you know how good he is. You know that he's like one of the most talented physical performers on the planet, but none of it really gets to come across or very little of it, like 10 percent of it gets to come across on screen in those films. Um, but when they said that he was going to be in a John Wick movie, you're like, okay, yes. 
because the John Wick movies have the same fundamental philosophy for action that the Hong Kong stuff has, which it's all stunt driven. It's driven by people who do the action, who understand it, who know how to do the stunts, who have done the stunts or are doing the stunts in the movie actively. And so it comes from that sort of stunt performance perspective first and foremost. And it's like, we've talked about it before, that it's effectively like an auteur driven approach to action because it is so much about like how these people who are complete experts in this craft having complete control, even if they're not like if Donnie Yen isn't the director of the movie as a whole, he is the director of that action scene in the movie, you know, like it's that kind of stuff. Um, and so he, these movies have that same kind of philosophy and you can feel it so much by them letting Donnie Yen do the fuck, the shit that Donnie Yen can do. Um, and you can tell, like, even if you didn't, you know, I know this cause I saw some like interviews that talked about this, but you could tell honestly, just by watching the movie, if you're familiar with this stuff, that they're letting Donnie Yen design some of the choreography for his scenes himself. Like he clearly, you feel that touch for how he's playing the character and how some of the like shots are shot and some of the things the character does clearly like he is coming up on set and like playing and coming up with ideas and they're incorporating it into the choreography. And they have talked about that in interviews and stuff. That's like, yeah, that's part of the approach that we ended up taking with some of the action, partially because we realized on set, once you had Don Yin doing some of this stuff, the choreography didn't work because of how like physically capable he is and how fast he can move and how this works out that like, no, that doesn't really make sense. So let's try it this way. Um, and so you get a little bit more of that improvisational Hong Kong style to those action scenes of them coming up with stuff on set and, and altering the choreo to make it work better. Um, and it just comes across throughout the whole movie. I think it's just th his performance, like especially physically, whether it's in the action scenes or just how he like walks and carries himself, you are getting like the 100% Donnie in experience, which is the first time that has in my, in anything I've seen that has ever happened in a Hollywood movie. And it's incredibly satisfying because he gets this character down 100% Right. It's not just the action. It is how the character walks. It's how he carries himself. It's how he looks in scenes and what he looks at, how he sits, how he stands. Like, you know, Donnie Yen is so much a physical performer that that is like the, the essence of the characters he plays comes from their physicality. And that's much more important to his performances typically than like the dialogue, though he does a good job with the dialogue. Um, but it's when you just like have him walk into a scene, the whole character comes together, right? His first scene in the movie where he comes in where the Marquis is um, and the Marquis is like doing the basically the thing that has happened to John Wick before of forcing him to make this deal. You can tell everything about this guy based on how he is holding himself and how he physically reacts to what is happening in the room. And it's incredibly satisfying to see Donnie and be able to show off like what he can do to a to an audience that many of whom like probably have not seen his movies but if you like a john wick movie you should go watch some of john yen's stuff because if you like these movies and especially if you like him in this there's a whole filmography for you to go watch of <laughs> incredible action movies with this dude just absolutely kicking ass and showing off how good he is at this shit yes it is it's truly incredible and i didn't doubt that Chad Stahelski and this crew would know what to do with John, Donnie Yen. I think, I think Chad Stahelski is one of the few directors in Hollywood who is equipped to work with a guy like this, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's, I do think there is this kind of like arrogance to a lot of Hollywood direction of, I directed one indie movie and I'm going to do a superhero movie and I can do all the effects and the fights and, and no, you can't. And it's a shitty movie. Uh, and I do think there's something about when you say like Donnie Yen can do action better than your director can, Chad Stahelski would be the first person to tell you that when yeah. he gets Donnie Yen on set because he is also a stuntman who knows how this all works and knows how to, the the what I think the real job of a director is, is to empower people to do their best work, right? Mm -hmm. Not to just tell them where to go and what to do, but to put them in a place where they can do their best stuff. And this movie builds such a space for Donnie Yen, whether that is in the action, which is incredible, but I think just as much what you're talking about there with like his scene with the marquee or something in just giving him a character who he can realize through his physicality because yeah. it just it just struck me early on in this movie like 
man, he is a great fucking actor. Like, man, mm-hmm. he just, he builds such a character here. This character has a life. He has a backstory. It's all there just in how he holds himself and moves through the world. The little detail of his first big action scene in the movie when he comes into the Osaka Continental and he starts putting down those little beeping devices around and you just see his whole technique for how he's going to take on this entire room of bad guys with a couple of these little beepers and his cane and a gun. And you just buy it 100%. This is something this guy does all day, every day. You totally get that. And that is Donnie Yen. And makes him a really good fit for Keanu Reeves because that's also the kind of actor Keanu Reeves is. You know, Reeves Mm -hmm. is not capable in in you know he is not a martial arts professional in the way donnie yen is but i do think keanu's strengths as an actor are in the same place like i think keanu must have less dialogue in this movie than any of the other john wicks uh but it might still be his best performance in them because he does just so he is such a good emotive physical communicator and that means him and donnie yen when they are in a scene together sparks just fly because i think they Mm -hmm. are actors who operate on a similar sort of principle there and yeah it is still so rare to see Hollywood treat actors from China, from Japan, from South Korea with any kind of actual respect. It usually is that the one I always think of, and I've made this you know joke before, is Chow Yun Fat in Pirates of the Caribbean Three, who uh-huh. is on the poster and then is in like two scenes and doesn't say anything and dies. Uh, and that is like, and that was Chow Yun Fat in two thousand seven. Like, I mean, God, you're talking about a guy who has ruled parts of the world at this point and that's the best you can do fuck off you racist fucks is what that feels like but it's so often that's how it works you know Mm -hmm. that's frankly how it feels in rogue one as you were describing is like it's using donnie yen in a way where really all they wanted was an asian man right they didn't want donnie yen they just wanted someone who could play the blind assassin archetype uh no this is he was asked to play a character he is second build in the movie behind keanu reeves and it that's correct that's just the keanu reeves is the main character and he's the next main character that is like an accurate summation and boy it is surprising to see that you know yeah and it's just a such a satisfying interesting character right that he it's you know that he he is like another john wick right um that he is someone else who found a life who found it you know, tries is trying to get out thought he got out is getting pulled back in um but the difference between him and john wick is that the person that he is like trying to live that life for his daughter is still alive um and so that's like a very like strong and satisfying narrative core that you have these two men you know who are so similar the, but the one thing that is different is that the thing that donnie Yen is living for is still out there whereas john wick is trying to live for the memory of his wife donnie Yen is trying to fight for the life of his daughter um yeah. and yeah and it's the drama is so potent immediately and and you know that especially with the Hiroyuki Sanada character getting thrown in there as this third friend who sort of represents like he's he's the person that both of them need to strive to be like right he's like this kind of paragon where he feels like the Sanada character has figured his shit out like he is a you know in this world, but he in this world of assassins, but he knows what really matters and was really important and is willing to fight for that thing. And he's not sort of blinded um, to like vengeance and all the kinds of like more petty things that I think are driving particularly John that he has kind of lost vision on what he needs to do and where he's and what his end point is. And so Sanda gives him that kind of guiding principle, and then you have you know what is. A, like legitimately really heartbreaking scene when Donnie Yen has to kill him at the end where it's like how little those two characters want to fight and there were actual like gasps in the movie theater when I watched it because of the way that scene plays out you so desperately just want them to stop because you know that like they're friends and how even though there's so little screen time committed to it how clearly that relationship comes across through the performances because you know like We've been talking about, a lot about Donnie Yen, but also Hiroyuki Sanada is act, absolutely at that same level yes. of like actor and physical performer and martial artist and stuff. So, you know, you're getting, you know, he's not in the movie as much because he dies at the end of the first act, but you're getting that other like world class level performance there and performer. Um, and the very quiet way in which that character gets killed is so <laughs> upsetting that that's like that last stab. There's no big music sting. There's no big... Like, it's not in your face. It's just you hear the sound of the sword going through him and you know that it's done. Um, And that's the thing that I think sets apart this movie right off the bat is that you just have this much 
bigger, more interesting, more invested supporting cast or main cast for this film that you're getting right off the bat that adds a whole other dimension to both the action because you're getting a variety of action here. You know, not every action scene has to center on John Wick, which is one of the things I think that helps the pacing is you get, you know, Donnie Yen fights in a very different way. He's not a judo guy, so he's not doing the John Wick stuff. So you get that variety, but you also get an emotional core that I think runs a lot deeper because of how much more invested you have become in the characters, even after just 20 minutes of this film. Yeah. And definitely, yeah, I don't want to shortchange Hiroyuki Sonata, who, you know, is this is a Japanese actor who has this incredibly long list of credits. You know, when you go back and look at his Japanese career, but when you look at his American career, he's been working in Hollywood since uh, The Last Samurai. He was in that movie in 2003. And then he's done a bunch of different things. I remember he was on a couple episodes of Lost back in the day. He mm -hmm. was in the, the Wolverine in Japan movie. He had a scene in Avengers Endgame, stuff like this. You go through that list of credits and they're all cases where I think they horribly underuse him, where it's yeah. just it's that thing of like they want generic Japanese guy and they get this wildly overqualified person. John Wick Chapter 4 got him to be Hiroyuki Sonata, not generic Japanese guy, but this actor for this part. And it is a relatively small part in the overall thrust of John Wick 4, but it's absolutely essential. And he does it with aplomb. It's a really beautiful performance. And just, again, you, you put him and Keanu Reeves in a room and say they're friends and you just buy it. You buy it immediately, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah. It's. It's that kind of thing where it's like he his performance is so good and the character is so interesting immediately that you kind of just assume he's going to be there for the whole movie because, because he's also in a bunch of the trailers. So it's like you really like, yeah, the, the thing you don't know is that like half of his scenes you see in the trailer because it's all at the <laughs> beginning of the movie. So because you, you just kind of assume, oh, this guy's of course he's going to be in the whole movie. Like, look how good he is. The fact that he gets killed at the end of the first act, like that's the good storytelling pieces you can you get so invested in the character you just assume he's got to be in this whole movie because look how cool this guy is and then him getting taken out after like 30 to 40 minutes is so fucking brutal yeah but i also really like his daughter character rena mm -hmm. sawayama who uh also does some very cool action stuff here she is also a singer she does the song that is over the end credits of this movie which is a pretty kick-ass song so that was kind of cool i always uh, we need to bring that back more of having the fucking yes. star of the, i mean this is a thing in other cinemas around the world that is a constant but like has kind of fallen out of fashion in american movies and i like it have the the star of the movie sing to me at the end god damn it i'm still mad that you know will smith movies don't do that anymore but anyway yeah where's this uh, where's this tennis rap for uh what is it king, king richard. richard yeah yeah like i want the tennis rap come on yeah, that's what I want. Uh, so we get that there. Uh, and then we have the Mr. Nobody character who is played by Shamir Anderson. And I loved this character because this is someone who's mm -hmm. so different than anyone we've seen in John Wick so far where he is he is a bounty hunter, but he's not really like part of the assassin world. Like yes. he's taken notes on it. He's kind of got their number because he's from the outside looking in. And his whole goal for the first, you know, two thirds of this movie at least, is to keep driving up John Wick's bounty and keep him alive so that he can eventually claim the maximum amount of money. Uh, one, that is just, this is a character plucked right out of a Sergio Leone Western. Yes. Uh, and I think it is so, it's so cool. It's such a nice touch. Yeah, it's a fun character. Like, he obviously doesn't have as much to do as um, uh, the Donnie Yen character because he's an outsider. Um, I do like he's the one character I do feel like they could have given a little bit more to him. Um, if there's like any criticism I have of the movie, I think they could have given him a little bit more like of a narrative core. What's here is still good. It's just like you could have pushed it a little bit further. And I also think them like with the Sawayama character kind of disappearing. I know that there's a post credit scene, which I didn't stay for because I assumed there is the only one that has a post credit scene. Um, but Koji's daughter just sort of disappearing for the whole movie felt a little bit weird. There's the only things that I think are a little bit off that could have been a little bit stronger about the film. But the tracker slash Mr. Nobody does have such like a important sort of role in the film but that he throws, he's this sort of joker, right? He throws the whole thing askew a because he is the only person we have seen in any of these movies that is not actually an assassin it is not like you know he's not paying for shit with weird gold doubloons and he doesn't have markers <laughs> and you know he's not like going into the continentals it's none of that kind of shit he is um you know someone who is in it entirely for himself like purely for profit um from the outside and it just gives this whole different flavor to the movie and then he also just gets to be a source of 
um, like some more comic relief and stuff like that. He's got his dog, which is awesome. And there's a running joke of where he keeps on saying nuts and the dog goes and chews on someone's nuts. Um, and <laughs> it's also where you get just all of the unbelievable dog stuff in John Wick Chapter 3. You know, I rewatched that movie like a week and a half ago um, in the lead up to 4. And I still cannot understand how the fuck they did half the shit they did with the two dogs in that movie. Um, and nothing here is as elaborate as that. Um, but it's like integrated very smoothly. If you know, there's nothing in here that feels like, oh, this is the dog set piece. It's just I'd like a naturally integrated element in each of the scenes that uh, Mr. Nobody shows up in. Um, and so it's like it keeps that like dog thing that is a running element of all the John Wick movies more dramatically for one and two, more actiony for three. Um, but dogs have to be there. You know, it's the inciting action of the whole fucking movie series is the death of John Wick's dog. So you got to have dogs be a present element. Um, and that's like one of those things that like the tracker is able to bring that in because it's such a like interesting and key part of his character. And I think like another way this movie like is very smart about bringing the story to a close is I think bringing it full circle and having John saving the man's dog instead of mm -hmm. killing the tracker when he has the chance and kind of John showing his true character to the tracker in that moment through his actions. Yeah. And of course, from that moment on, the tracker is not going after him. Mr. Nobody does not want to kill John. He has chances to, and it's like, the dude saved my dog. There's that beautiful moment where he just looks down at his happy fucking dog and it's like, I can't kill this guy. Like, why yeah. would I? This this guy's great. And so he becomes the... And, and this is where, like, I do understand what you're saying about maybe wishing there was a little bit more of a spine there with it. I think why it works for me is it's just the movie has such a good sense of the archetype that it just, like... And I think uh, Shamir Anderson knows... Uh, is playing that archetype very well. That it's just, you know, when he is there and he's the guy watching as the sun comes up for the final duel, it just falls into place so beautifully. Mm -hmm. and And I love all of that. But while we're still kind of on the Osaka section, um, the the blend of action things they are doing in this part of the movie just blows my mind so intensely. It's it's a couple of different things. It's one is that this is like you know it's a big gun fu sequence, the stuff John Wick does best. But then we start bringing in katanas and we start bringing in nunchucks and all sorts of things. And eventually, like there's there's parts of the battle going on in this this first hour of the movie where you have like five six weapons like interchanging mm -hmm. and they're also using their you know clothes because their clothes are all ballistic suits and all this stuff um and it's wild but there's also something you said at the beginning sean which is it's these bigger open spaces and it's much more like groups of people fighting you know there's always been the comparison of john wick to musicals because i think good action is a lot like shooting a good musical yeah. and i've often thought of the john wick movies so far kind of in the gene kelly singing in the rain kind of vein of things where it's like a performer who is empowered and the camera is like there to really capture their full bodily performance there's something about john wick four at points that is almost like busby berkeley who was known for like the big choreographed like hundreds of people on screen making shapes and things like that because the japan part especially but also part Parts, I think like with the car action in the Paris section and stuff mm -hmm. where you have so many moving pieces on screen what boggles your mind about the choreography isn't just the like interpersonal complexity of it but the amount of people the amount of bodies the amount of motion that is being captured it's it's symphonic it's not individual anymore yeah I think that is like a good comparison where it's just it has expanded the horizon um, both like, you know, metaphorically and then literally like visually you are getting like a full horizon with like this big distance that characters can be on this like much bigger stages fighting each other. Um, yeah, and it, it is it adds a very different flavor to some of the action. And then, yeah, they, you know, this is where you get just them. It's it's like the beginning of John Wick 3 where they just have John run through a bunch of places and be like, oh, what the fuck could he find here that he could use as a weapon? Oh, he's in a knife <laughs> store. Oh, he's got to like put together like an old like, you know, 19th century revolver or whatever and shoot one dude with it, which is still one of the funniest things in a John Wick movie is that yes, scene is. at the beginning of John Wick 3. You spent like three minutes putting that thing together to fire one bullet. Um, but here you get the nunchucks, which is really cool. Um, and I, I love all the shit with nunchucks. In particular, like it's the extended sequence where he puts the nunchucks like over his shoulder or whatever, and he's got his gun. And so he's like switching between using his gun and using judo and using the nunchucks. That's really cool. But my favorite shit here is all the stuff with the bows, uh, because that's something you've never gotten. Yes. Bows and arrows are really cool. That's like basically the, the Nina Sabayama character's specialty or whatever. So you get some of that stuff at the beginning of the fight with them on the rooftop. 
where she's doing a bunch of cool shit with the bows. Um, and, you know, there, there's some cool stuff, particularly in like the Hawkeye TV show where they did some cool bow shit here. But this is where you're getting. No, this is you want to get some really cool action scenes and melee scenes involving bows where you're going between using it as like a staff to shooting arrows and stuff. This is like the real deal. And there's one amazing part where a guy goes, I think he's going to like kick John Wick or whatever. And the Sawayama character shoots his leg with an arrow that like pins the leg to the wall. And then John Wick gets up on the dude and just shoots him in the face um, while his leg is just like dangling there because it just got shot through with an arrow and fucking pierced to the wall. That's pretty fucking amazing. Like they just there's a lot of really creative stuff they do um, with the bows here that I appreciated. Yes. Love all of that. And like. Uh, lest we undersell Mr. Keanu Reeves while we're singing the praises of everything else, uh, the physicality he displays when he gets those nunchucks out, which mm -hmm. I presume is not like a mastery he had going into this. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing the way he handles those things and the way he is moving between that and judo and the gun foo stuff. And it is so fluid and it is so seamless. And there is not a lot of cutting in that sequence. Like it is yeah. all like they are doing it and it is mostly not his stunt double. You can see his face. He's full body right there. Um, that is, I think, physically some of the most impressive stuff he's done in this entire series. Yeah, I mean, I think across the board, this is the best. Um, I think this is just the best performance he's given, regardless of, I think you're right, he has less dialogue here, but in some ways that, like, works more to the character's advantage. Like, it's very much, with the Leone thing, they put him more clearly in a Clint Eastwood. He's very much a man of few words. I think, like, the whole second half of the movie, he says, like, five sentences or something, and it's mostly, ah, I'm going to kill you, and that's about it. And yeah. it's like, <laughs> that's what you need. Uh, but it's such a physical performance but yeah, his physical performance, I think, is just at another level. Like some of like the judo style takedowns he does here just feel so much more like kind of higher level, more advanced stuff. I think you can just feel, you know, he's always been a good martial artist going back to the Matrix movies and stuff. But I think you can feel how serious and dedicated he has been to these John Wick movies. John Wick 1 is almost 10 years old, so he's been doing these for a long time. Um, and yeah, like Keanu Reeves is getting up there in age, but he's also been practicing this stuff really heavily now, specifically for the John Wick movies for at least nine years at this point. So um, I think you just see some more elaborate martial arts from him, and I think he just physically carries himself so well in, the, in this movie in particular. And yeah, that nunchuck stuff is probably the the best like hand hand choreo he has not just in this movie but in all of the john wick movies that feels like it is like his his best and like most interesting physical performance here yeah but then like also all of the it, it bordering on slapstick in the final act and everything in paris mm -hmm. one thing i noticed is that uh john uh, he gets hit by cars in all of the John Wick movies. He gets hit by a lot of cars in this one. And uh -huh. Keanu has very clearly... Uh, Keanu does not take the car hits. Like, that is his stuntman. That is <laughs> stuntman. That is what they are there for, is to take the hits from the cars. Because Keanu probably could do it, but if something went wrong, um, he'd be fucked and the movie would be fucked, right? And yeah. so stunt people know how to take the hit so that they won't get hurt. But you will often have, before the cut happens and it's the stuntman, you will have Keanu Reeves on screen. You'll, you're seeing his face doing the brace of like how you go in basically to get hit by a car and not get hurt. And it's just like he's clearly picked that up from all the stuntmen he's worked with and he can do the pose and the bracing and everything. And it's just such a physically believable performance where mm -hmm. it's not even all that silly that you're buying that John Wick is surviving all these hits because he's so... Getting, like leaning into all of it and that just makes it such a complete performance yes yeah and it does feel like they've built in that it is you know it is like john wick as a character knows what he's doing and knows how to yeah avoid taking the brunt of the hit and he's like there's one really clean one they get i think it's in the, this earlier section where he like jumps and gets a bit horizontal and he like only hits the windshield and you can like really yes. cleanly see it and yeah like you're saying it makes it believable that yeah, it probably hurts like fuck, but like nothing's broken. He's not dead. Um, he just like catches wind and then he can continue on with the fight. Um, yeah, the, like all that stuff is some of the stuff that makes these movies really fun is that you just get a feel. They're not trying to hide the stunts. They're not trying to pretend on anything with the stunts. They're just like showing it to you and making it a full part of the movie. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, Keanu, just to give you an idea of how good the people in this movie are, Keanu Reeves is 58 and Donnie Yen is 59. Yeah. And they are doing this stuff 
Oh my god. Just uh, absolute crazy people. I love them. Donnie Yen, his first action beat in this movie, I think, is where he unleashes this like flurry of punches on this mm-hmm. dude. And he moves so fast in that scene. For a second I went, my natural brain response to that is, oh, that's a cool instance of speed ramping. Which is where you like speed the frame up a little bit. Like Mad Max does this a lot. A lot of action movies do this. Old silent films especially. And then I, I, I it keeps going and I'm like... Oh, wait, no, they're not speed ramping that because he's the only thing moving that fast. Oh, shit. Donnie Yen can actually move that fast. This is crazy. And, uh, you know, you're in for a good time. It's just wild. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. That's where they feel like they they pull in the little bit of like Ip Man style. Just like I'm going to punch you like 50 times in like two seconds. And you just watch it like. What the f- what the fuck? <laughs> that was so this is like a fucking anime where their like arms are disappearing, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it yeah, it literally is like watching Dragon Ball where they're punching so fast that it's just like speed lines. But you're watching it in this real life. You're like, how the f- what the fuck is this man? Um, and, and as you said, he's like 59. It's like this is fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff of his first action scene. I also love the the intro to it where they're they're fighting in like the kitchens or whatever because they've gotten into the back rooms and he's just like in this weird like dark corner just like slurping some ramen or whatever because yes. he obviously doesn't <laughs> want to fight any of these people. You know, he is there to kill John Wick because he is being forced to and that is it. Um, and then eventually the the one guy who I know is another like big martial arts performer who's like the Marquis like right hand man. Um, that guy's like, come on, like do your fucking job. He's like, oh, OK. And then he goes and just like beats the shit out of these dudes. Um, that's where he gets the like hundred punches and all that stuff. Um, yeah, all of the everything yes. they do there with the framing of that scene is amazing. Yeah, the right hand guy is uh, Marco Zoror, who is a Chilean yes. martial artist. Uh, yeah. Mainly in Taekwondo and kickboxing, but also Judo, Aikido, and Shokatan Karate. So anyway, uh, yes, everyone in this movie is very uh, adept. But anyway, yeah. In the the middle section of this movie is probably the most plot heavy, although you also do have an incredible series of fights in Berlin that is also very impressive. Uh, but some other characters to talk about here. Uh, what did you think of the our, our villain this time around? The Marquis Vincent de Gromont, played by Bill Skarsgård, who I think was perfectly cast because he has such a shootable face. Yes, yeah. It, he's, it definitely feels like it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a similar kind of thing we got in two, where you have just this absolute smarmy, fucking rich piece of shit motherfucker. Um, but I think the thing with Bill Skarsgård here that I think it probably like is an evolution of the kind of villain you had in two, which is all about his sort of like class and privilege and his institutional power, is that I think... Bill Skarsgård is actually intimidating in those scenes, even though you know that like when it comes down to it, there's no way he would be able to survive an actual fight against John Wick without all of this stuff protecting him. It feels like he is so much more adept at wielding his institutional power versus D'Antonio from two, who is, you know, has some institutional power, but he's also trying to get his way into the high table. Right. Whereas this guy um, is basically been, you know, invested with all these specific power to, to, to take down John Wick and clean up this mess. And yeah, I think Bill Skarsgård carries himself incredibly well. He's got a, like, very Matt Smith Doctor Who walk thing he does that is, like, a very particular <laughs> tick. That's the only other actor I've ever seen do where he's got, like, these kind of hunched shoulders and he really puts his hands down really low. And it just creates this sort of, like, brooding, um, the very kind of, like, high-class sort of uh, way he carries himself that I think is interesting. And then the Bill Skarsgård character is also, along with Hiro Kisanada, is the other character where you're like, this movie should get a fucking Oscar for costume design. Because every scene this guy is in, he has a completely different outfit. And there, it's all like, there. it's just the most ridiculously high class looking suits and suit coats and frocks and all this shit. Um, In every scene, it's different. They all look so, like, lavish and expensive and almost to the point where it's, like, kind of over the top, which is kind of sort of the point of how you're seeing him put his wealth on display. Uh, And it's like, whoever made all those costumes, because there's got to be, like, a dozen plus suits that this dude wears across the movie. Um, They did a good fucking job because those costumes are amazing looking. Yeah. I do kind of love the niche Bill Skarsgård has, like cleaned out for himself of he's Pennywise in the It movies and he's the villain, the smarmy asshole villain here. He's going to be in the Robert Eggers Nosferatu movie playing Orlock, the Dracula Uh. character, which is, he has that face. He just has Mm -hmm. this like 
you know, it's like a pretty boy face that's like 10 degrees off. There's something yes. off with it where you just feel this kind of evil to it. That I mean, I'm sure he's a nice guy in real life, but like it is just in his movies, it's used very well. Um, and I love it. And yeah, so you have him. Um, who else have we not talked about? Uh, oh, you know, one thing I think we should back up on is his kind of intro to the movie is when he comes into the New York Continental and destroys right. it, which is also where you get... Um, Sadly, Lance Reddick's uh, last scene in this series as Charon, who is killed there. Um, I think for the movie, that is the right call. Like, it feels like he should die with the hotel is kind of what that feels like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it also, like, sets up the dramatic stakes. I also think that um, it's... We, we did not talk about this last week, but Lance Reddick died suddenly last week uh, at the age of 60, very tragically. Um, and it is... I, I imagine that if they had known that, that would not be the scene in the movie because it is extra painful to watch given reality. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I we did not talk about it last week in part because I knew we were going to talk about him this week. And even in his one scene here, you remember why you loved Lance Reddick because he is he was such a giant, such a great actor. Yeah, it's yeah, it's incredibly tragic and sad that he passed away. And as you said, it's I think it is his scene in the movie is the absolutely the right scene for this movie. It's one of the things that I think sets it up immediately as you feel like this is the last John Wick movie. Um, yeah. Although they have, there's a spinoff movie called The Ballerina that they've already shot that he is in as well. Yes. Which I guess takes place before this um, because him and Ian McShane and Keanu Reeves are all going to be in that as well. Um, but in terms of like the timeline or whatever, it, it feels like you're you're signaling, OK, this is the end of this journey. Um, and yeah, Lance Reddick is just an amazing, was an amazing actor. Um, and, and is, was that kind of actor that like whatever role he played, like whether it was like very big or very small, just gave absolutely 110% to whether it was in live action, but also the sort of video game stuff like Zavala and Destiny or, um, his character in Horizon, who's like the best character in those games and always felt like he just like really gave it 110% and just like led such a lent such a huge amount of kind of credibility to the story of those games. Um, and then as Caron in these movies, you know, he's never been a hugely central character other than in three, he's got a lot of really good stuff um, at the end when they let him do some of the action and he's fucking incredible there. But he's just one of those, like the part of the glue that has always held this series together that he, along with Ian McShane as like a pair like totally sell this insane world, right? That's like the big turning point in John Wick 1 when he goes to the Continental and you have the Lance Reddick character there and you meet him for the first time and he's, you know, like the manager will see you now. And like the way that Lance Reddick holds himself as almost like a parody of this kind of like upper class, like elite uh, concierge of a, um, a super fancy New York hotel, um, but then the sort of nonchalant way he reacts to all the insanity that is going on in the hotel while he's behind his desk and is having to answer phone calls or knows that some bullshit is happening because John gets like attacked in his hotel room and all that stuff. Um, it just like so centers the the weird off kilter world because Lance Reddick takes it so seriously and brings it all here and like sort of settles it all in this kind of uncanny way. Um, that yeah, it's incredibly sad that he died. He was such a good actor, um, and I wish that he could be in this movie more because you know it's that it's in terms of the chronology of the characters, it's his last performance. Um, even though obviously you know there's no way you are ever going to know any of that kind of shit, you're not going to write the movie predicting that that's going to happen. Um, but it's very sad that he doesn't get that you don't get to see more of him in this as this character in this movie, even if it's the right choice for the plot. Yeah. And I, I agree with all of that, and I feel very bad for everyone who worked on this movie because mm -hmm. his death basically happened the day of the premiere, um, and so it was like they had to go, you know, premiere this movie and also pay tribute to their friend. I guess you didn't stay to the end of the credits, Sean. There is a tribute to him at the end. There is a dedication screen of In Memory of Lance Reddick, which I am kind of blown away they got out to theaters that fast. I know it's mm -hmm. all digital now, so they don't have to make prints, but that's still, like, DC, that is still, like, I assume a lot of theaters already had their DCPs of this, and there was some kind of update that had to go out because it happened so last minute. Um, but I am glad they got that in there because it feels right. And it has been, 
as sad as it is, it has also been very beautiful to see everyone's remembrances from Chad Stahelski and Keanu Reeves to people who worked with him on other projects as well. Because he very much, <laughs> you know, Keanu, we all know, is the kind of person who everybody in this industry loves. And I feel like John Wick, he's kind of collected a lot of other people who are like that. Mm-hmm. And it seems like Lance Reddick was that kind of person, too, where everyone who ever worked with him had stories about what a nice, gregarious, energetic, you know, person he was on set and what a nice person he was interpersonally. Um, and, you know, Keanu Reeves and Chad Stahelski had become very close personal friends with him, it sounds like. And, you know, I feel uh, just huge condolences for their their loss. Um, but he was, yeah, he was such a great actor. And all the roles you talked about, Sean, you know, one of, one of the most notable Hollywood actors who worked in gaming and loved it and wasn't mm-hmm. slumming it or acting like that. This was just his, you know, we, he was playing Destiny 2 the night before he died, we learned. Um, And that community's, you know, remembrances of him has been a really beautiful example of video game communities. Um, But obviously in live action, too, you know, if you want to see what I think is probably his best live action work, that's probably The Wire, um, which is one of his biggest ongoing roles. But everything he was ever in, he was just the consummate character actor, which, you know, John Wick, this franchise has collected those kind of actors, him and Lawrence Fishburne and um, Ian McShane. And here you have Clancy Brown, but he was one of the best of all of them and will be very, very missed. Yeah, and even though he's not in the movie very much, like, he actually, like, kills the, the, like, two scenes that he gets at the beginning of this movie, you know? I mean, as part of the emotional core of the film is his death scene um, and everything that um, leads up to it and his, you know, that kind of quiet trust and loyalty he has to Winston, the Ian McShane character, is so touching and powerful um, that, again, it's, it's one of those things that sets up the arc you're going to have to see John Wick on because of course like Caron's death is basically on John Wick's head because John doing all the insane shit he's been doing for the past couple of movies is what has led this series of events to occur and so him having to learn not just to care about himself but like the people his friends and the people that have helped him um through his grief and through everything all this bullshit that's happened like that's what's more important than him getting revenge and that's what he learns at the end of the movie and does for the Donnie Yen character and all of that is set up by that opening scene with Lance Reddick and just like the general sense of mortality enters the scene and it Mm -hmm. hasn't really been a thing in the John Wick movies for a while now right Um, and so now because Charon has died everyone is thinking about that you know when John meets up with Ian McShane again their first scene is at Karen's grave Mm -hmm. and it sets up that whole idea of gravestones and you have that you know beautiful moment where they're asking what would you want on your tombstone and John finally answers you know loving husband Um, and that's what we get at the end of the movie so it is like it is a complete arc and it is very important for the movie that that scene happens it's a very like there are no small roles thing right it had to be someone you knew and someone you loved and this this was the right person to do it with um but yeah um but yeah what an actor uh ian mcshane as always just man i love i love that we've had four of these fucking movies with ian mcshane and ian mcshane seems like he is loving him loving it uh, every step of the way he seems Mm -hmm. so engaged with these it must be a fun part to do yeah and i feel like this movie gives him the most stuff to do because it's like it's the most range we get to see out of winston right i feel like we've gotten more and more of him in each movie because you get all the stuff in three with um them having to fight the high table and stuff and then him seemingly betraying john at the end of that movie um but then here he gets this like bigger emotional range because he has to respond to the death of caron and then that scene between him and john at the grave is really powerful where you feel like winston who's always so polite who's always like so like accommodating even when he's you know it's in this very kind of like british way of where even if it's not actually being accommodating he's going to seem accommodating and just kind of like poke you with these kind of verbal barbs um that scene like he just like you know goes full off of like like have you fucking learned nothing like are you just going to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again and him like actually getting angry and like getting very emotional in that scene um, where you see the mask um, and the kind of the stoicism that that character wears like lower for a bit is great. And then um, him opposite the marquee 
in that later incredible scene in the fucking museum with the giant yes. pieces of art and you have that incredible shot that's like holds for like two minutes or something as Ian McShane's just walking to the right of the frame and the camera's <laughs> following him going past painting after painting after painting in this like almost Citizen Kane-esque just like ludicrously massive I assume they probably shot that in an actual museum but it's like this just insanely giant hallway that like just keeps going on and on and on um and, and him just sort of like you know outmaneuvering the 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 marquee is incredibly satisfying and, and so yeah Ian McShane's key scenes in this movie in this movie is he just fucking nails it he also gets the fucking amazing kiss off line to the marquee at the end where the marquee is walking over to kill John and he's like you arrogant ass he hasn't fired yet and then John of course his consequences and shoots him in the head and uh you stand up and cheer because it is yeah. so perfect yeah, yeah, yeah. Ed McShane just <laughs> kills it. And I love, you know, that Winston throughout this whole movie, you know, as this, uh, he has his angle, right? Like, I, I love him that he, like, sort of manipulates this scenario, not just to, like, kind of get revenge, but also to create the situation where he gets his hotel back. Um, and that yes. scene where they're deciding the duel and, and, and that information comes out and John, like, looks over at him. And he just sort of shrugs. It's fucking great. <laughs> yes. You know, he is a hotel man in his core. Like, I, I do believe that about Winston. He's in this world of assassins, but I think he genuinely likes running a hotel. I think that yeah. is like, he, he genuinely has a passion for it. He wants his fucking hotel back. He's he's good at it. No, I love that. I love that you have Clancy Brown as like oh the operative God. of the high table. Like, how has Clancy Brown not been in these movies yet? It felt like when he came on screen, I genuinely, Sean, had to go through my memory and be like, has he been in these movies yet? Because he seems like such a quintessential John Wick actor. And I'm so glad he he's in here because his role in this is fantastic yeah because as you said like it does feel like these movies just sort of like pick up whether they use them for like a recurring character or like oh you just be in like one or two movies like john leguizamo in the first two it's like they just pick up these like character actors and yes clancy brown 100 percent is just he slots in completely seamlessly i love his (laughs) fucking outfit with the hat and everything in this movie is so good um i love it i just like like the kind of vague role because he's called a harbinger right he's like that's how he's introduced at the beginning (laughs) of the movie is like a harbinger has arrived um and that's when they destroy the new york continental hotel i just love the vague like what power structure is like what really like is he more powerful or less powerful than bill skarsgård character it's just like it's just fucking clancy brown like it's just you do what this dude says um you know he's he is the (laughs) voice of lex luthor from the fucking superman cartoon it's like you you pay attention to this guy he uh, no, I love. Uh, there's actually kind of a weariness to him of like he mm-hmm. clearly what he does is he like ex- he does the high tables bidding, but I think he knows the high table are full of shit is a little mm-hmm. bit of what I get from him in this because when you first see him they do this actually close up on his hand where you see he's missing the same finger John is missing. Yeah. So presumably he is in a similar arrangement of having like had to reaffirm his loyalty to the high table, and so there is this kind of like. I think he's pretty relieved when the Marquis is dead at the end of this movie is the uh-huh. sense I get. Um, but I love that. That whole fucking scene where they are deciding the like stakes of the duel and they have these big, giant, like marble cards that they're flipping over to see like who will have the higher number so they can choose the method and the time and the place. That is, I just love the world building of John Wick so much. Everything about it is just one or two notches extra and it's so beautiful. Yeah, and it's just like the gravitas of Clancy Brown. It's just like, it makes you believe all of it. Because yeah, that scene is so like ridiculous and just arch in this insane way. It's like, yeah, this big weird glass table with giant marble tarot cards um, and all this (laughs) shit. Um, But you've got Clancy Brown standing there and he says like, it will be at sunrise. It's like pistols. Dueling pistols at 30 paces. Uh, it's just like, okay, yeah. I, yeah, okay, I guess that's how it is. It's dueling pistols at 30 paces. Nobody's going to comment on the insane way that you are deciding this duel. If this is just the way that it works. You know, these, there are rules, and we got to follow them. It is great. Uh, unless we forget our last, like, giant character actor in this, Lawrence Fishburne, who mm-hmm. in this movie is basically playing John Wick's hype man. Which I love. Like, every scene he comes in, he is, like, hyping him up. The first scene of this movie is so good because, one, you have the best punch sound effect I think I've ever heard is the opening of this movie is John punching a big plank of wood. And I don't know about your sound system, Sean, but it gave the one at my theater a fucking workout and it hit me in my bones. You feel that sound effect. 
Yes, no, it like I like my seat was basically vibrating in the theater because of how like yeah. resonant that sound effect was. Yeah, yeah, you have him punching, and then uh, Lawrence Fishburne she comes in. It's intercut with him uh, doing the speech from uh, the Divine Comedy about like um, all ye who enter here and all that kind of shit. Um, it's fucking yes. yeah, it's fucking great. Oh man, I just Lawrence Fishburne I think is the most he's here having fun in these movies, mm-hmm. like all three of them, you just get the sense that like, this is his like, because he's probably not on set that long for any of these, but this is like almost like a vacation for him. And he is here to have fun with his buddy Keanu. Yeah. <laughs> and I just love the, the, the kind of casual chemistry they have. Oh, it's good. It's so good. Yeah. You have that great scene where they're in the subway in Paris and the Bowery King is there too. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like expanding and opening some franchises or whatever. It's like, yes. uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> I've, I've always loved the Bowery King because he, it's you're, it's so vague what role he plays in this world and like what his relationship is to everything else. Um, but, you know, he's it's just so, you know, Lawrence Fishburne attacks that character with this incredible enthusiasm. It's the most over the top performance in any of these movies, which is kind of saying something for some of uh, the style of this movie, these movies go for. But it's like he like choose that fucking scenery, but it's exactly what you want him to do. Um, it's because he just has such a different tone. Everything in these movies is very like self-serious and very heavy because that's what grounds everything. And then the Barry King shows up and he's just this like jovial, insane, like King who's just, you know, having fun with the madness of this world. He feels like he's the only person in these movies that understands that everything that is going on is completely fucking insane. And he's just having a great time with it. He absolutely is. Uh, I love the moment where he comes up to Winston in the rain and Winston is standing outside the ruins of the Continental and he has the little line about we're both homeless now, which is just so good. Him needling Winston. Two other characters we haven't talked about yet, which will get us back into kind of the second act of this movie in Berlin, is John goes to Berlin to get back into his family, the Jordanovich family, so he can claim his place at the high table and do the duel. And so he meets up, the character there is played by Natalia Tena, who's been in a bunch of great stuff. She was in Harry Potter. She was in Game of Thrones. Um, I always like her and I always feel like she's a little underused. And I really liked her part here as like his adoptive sister. And then you have Scott Adkins in the other craziest part in this movie as Keela, the head of the German table with the crazy gold teeth. Uh, This part of the movie is properly weird and I love it. Yeah, it's fucking great. You know, Scott Adkins is one of those like he's, you know, mostly a stunt guy though. Like he's he's a stunt man who is so good that he was like, you know, in he was the, he's the villain like every action movie forever because it's like he does the stunts and so it's like the stunt guy plays like the right-hand man kind of character until eventually, you know, he was in so much of that stuff there he like sort of fully just became a an actor actor basically who also does all the martial arts stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it's like it's a fun another just sort of check off one of those like kind of great stunt martial arts performers um, that the John Wick movies have collected over the years, along with their, um, you know, kind of character actors. You get these stunt performers. And so getting him in here was very fun. And you get this fun, you know, he's he's obviously wearing a fat suit as the character. The character is very physically over the top. But I like that what they do with that is they create this fun contrast of where the character's fighting style is like very mobile and it's all these like big high kicks and stuff like that. And I think there's like a really interesting contrast they play where you like look at the character and you think, Oh, when he fights, it's going to be big grapples and stuff like that. And it's going to be the big heavy dude. And in fact, it's like, no, the thing is that he's really nimble and he's very quick and, but he's got a lot of power behind the hits. And that's why, you know, he probably gives John the the hardest fight he's had in any of these movies because the end of this movie is like the last action sequence for four isn't really about like a big fight against a one on one foe it's about a giant insane gauntlet he has to get through and then this duel whereas this is where you get the last big one on one fight here is an opponent who is like going to give John a run for his money and I really like how they choreograph and design that whole scene. Well, that's where you get this entire, uh, your kind of classic John Wick setup of it's all happening in the middle of a fucking rave. Yes. And it's out in the rain. And so there's water everywhere. And of course, there's neon lights. It's just all the stuff you kind of associate with big, silly John Wick action sequences from that like big club scene 
all the way back in the first movie where I think even the sprinklers turn on at one point. So it's also mm-hmm. technically in the rain and wet. Um, but yeah, it is really well done. You have John getting thrown off the balcony and then coming back up, which previews kind of what we're going to get at the end of the movie. Uh, but all of that is great. But I like, I like as good as the action scene is there, I kind of was even more into just this quiet, like tense poker scene mm-hmm. they all have where you get the good, the bad, and the ugly, all three of them around the table with Scott Adkins and it is such a good, like, tense scene laced with the utter silliness of Scott Adkins' character in this movie. Uh, it's just very tonally well executed. Yeah, and I love the the ending of that scene is amazing because he's, like, slowly turning over the twos. Yes. Um, and you know where this is going to go because it's five-card draw and then he's got five twos. And then the kisser <laughs> for that is that Donnie, <laughs> even though Donnie's character is blind, like, he's like... It's five twos, isn't it? I'm sorry, it's, or it's yes. five of a kind, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it's like, and then he just says in, in Chinese, it's like, I knew this is a cheating asshole. It's like, yeah, yep. he's an asshole. <laughs> and then we kick off into just, that's part of why the fight is so good, is like the build up to it is so long and fun and like agonizing. So I love all that. I love when John is like accepted back into his family. They have to do this big crest he brands on his arm. So they like fill this big pot with like fucking molten like hot liquid and then they're both putting their arms on it and then drinking. Uh, Like John has been branded and had fingers cut off. Like just a lot of bodily mutilation for him in the last couple of movies. Yeah it's yeah it's it's it gets pretty brutal. Um, Yeah I love all that scenes. I love that they like pour alcohol on it to like cool it off and then they yes. drink it it's yeah silly one of my favorite Badass. like weird touches in the the big nightclub fight uh, is i love you know i because i guess you know in osaka they all use katana so it makes sense you go to germany and they've all got these like medieval fucking hand axes that they're using and it's <laughs> that's like what most of that fight is centered around is either like hand hand or it's we've got fucking axes and it's just like it's one of the silliest things because you don't even you have no idea why are we using hand axes where did you guys get all these hand axes from like at least with katanas in japan there's like a ceremonial thing associated with it where you'd understand why they would have katanas around even if it is a little silly or stereotypical uh but i've never got the sense that if you go to germany like oh here's my like ancient family hand axe that dates back to the 30 years war or some (laughs) shit you know uh but it's just a really good excuse to have a different kind of weapon you get to do and you know you get some good john wick throwing an axe into a dude's head um scenes and it's fucking great and some just very meaty sound design on all yeah. of that. It's it's good. Axes through the air and then into skulls sound very uh, impactful, let's say. Yeah. And then we're in Paris for uh, the craziest hour of cinema that's maybe ever been achieved. Yeah. Jesus Christ, the last hour of this movie, Sean, is nuts. I mean, one, I just adore the setup of Pistols at Dawn. We're going to end this thing with a proper old-fashioned duel with dueling pistols, and John's thing is he's going to have to get from, you know, the the lair of the 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 Bowery Kings area all the way to this church. And so it's this gauntlet he has to go through to get there. And just as soon as they've set that up, you know you're in for something special. But I think the specific like the number of different like bespoke action sequences and locations and styles and ideas they fit in to this last, you know, 40 minutes to an hour of film culminating in that incredible slapstick of the staircase is just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Like, it's definitely, it is in that kind of absolute top tier action set piece. It's up there with shit like the, the hospital fight at the end of Hard Boiled. It's like, this is, if you want to make yeah. your list of the best action set piece, like extended action set pieces in a movie ever, like this is in that conversation for sure. Um, because, yeah, because the other part of the framing... Um, and this is one where I saw this movie with my dad in the theater. You want to make sure I mentioned this on the on the podcast, okay. um, which is that it's it's the radio station. Right. So there's this incredible like yes. radio DJ lady who is um, sending out the call. This is also in the trailer. Um, and I, I love that it, how fully integrated it is in the movie. It's more it's it more a part of the movie than I thought it was going to be based on the trailer. Uh, but the radio station is W-U-X-I-A, uh, which Wusha. is Wusha. Yep. And my dad, again, he wanted me to make sure he mentioned it because he, he, he noticed it in the movie, which is great. 
Um, yes. And then that serving as sort of the backing track for a lot of the fight and then breaking up the sequences of the fight so to like to make the pacing clear. So it's like at the end of a section, you cut back to the radio DJ lady. She gives something else out. She introduces another song that's going to introduce us to the next set piece. It's just a really masterful framing device to, to both, again, give you that extra little touch of the madness of this world. You know, we've seen all the weird like sort of operators or whatever, like in an old school phone setup where they're like changing the cables and have their like the bounty that's written on a chalkboard and all that. And so, of course, you'd also have a radio at night radio DJ who is giving out secret (laughs) hits um, over the radio Uh, that that starts being a little bit like I love it. Eventually, it starts becoming very little code. Like it's first, it's very much like sort of shrouded in like this metaphoric language to like sort of code what they're saying. The eventually starts to become pretty specifically like, yeah, this guy's going to be over here uh, and he's, he looks like this and we got to go kill him. Uh, it's like it starts to get pretty specifically like we just got to get this guy. Yep. It's amazing. The first big part of this is in that I don't know what is this called, but it's a real location in Paris. The giant roundabout that is oh, the like, Arc de Triomphe. Yes. Where you have this entire massive fight sequence in that where you have this this hand-to-hand and gun foo in the middle of all these cars going around and you just have people constantly being thrown into cars and getting hit by cars and it's just oh my gosh sean the the like the sheer madness of the choreography of that like truly boggles my mind yeah this is the thing that when you were uh, referencing the the dance thing yes. earlier that yes this is that the scene that's like that particularly you have some of those shots where you just see all the cars going around you have like the intro into it i love where you have you know john has because john kills a bunch of guys and takes the car and then drives the the roundabout in the arctic triumph and then you have this like legion of cars that follow him that then when they get to the roundabout they split off and go in both directions like one of them going against traffic um and then that just starts sending everything it like off kilter and insane and yes just this weird crazy running circular fight Um, That's very balletic as they're trying to dodge cars um, and throwing people into cars and all this fucking madness. Um, You have this whole incredible sequence that sort of opens up all of that, which is when John Wick is still in his car and you have some of the best like stunt driving stuff in any of these movies. Um, and he, you know, there's a great, great shot where he's just like doing a donut around this group of dudes and just fucking shooting at, at them at the window. It just goes and goes and goes as he's spinning around them. Um, and then eventually he gets out of the car and gets to fight on foot. It's just it's fucking insane. Like in any other movie that would have just been on its own, the big last action set piece. And you wouldn't even add any more because it's so good. It's so high concept. It must've been insane to try to do that. I have no idea how you execute it on a, like a technical level and get all those moving pieces to work appropriately. Um, but that's just like the opening gambit. <laughs> this fucking whole yes. sequence. It's insane. It's also a pretty clear montage to the beginning of John Wick 2, where mm-hmm. you have the big car foo scene that I love, yes. where he goes and gets his car back, and by the end of it, there's no doors on the car, which is what happens here, where he's driving around without doors, and he's and it's just, yeah, it's just Keanu in this car without doors, driving around, shooting people. There's that part where he has this really cool gun that Winston gives him, which I was immediately, because I'm in Resident Evil 4 mode, I'm like, ooh, I want that gun in Resident Evil 4. It's a really cool pistol. Pistols are useful. But he has that gun, and he, like, drops it at one point, and so then you have Keanu like leaning out of the car to like drive by and pick up the gun off the ground while he's driving. There's just so many good moves like that. And you're mm-hmm. absolutely right. It would be it, like you could get by with that being the only action sequence in your action movie and it would be great. And it's one of like 10 in this movie. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. Then you have a whole part where we have like some really classic John Wick action of him moving through buildings and catacombs and all of that stuff. And this is where you get all the people who come in with they've built guns that have like explosive ammo to try to get through his tactical vest. Yes, and this well, is you also have, where uh, in the intro of the sequence when the radio DJ is going, you do have that piece where you see like all these different groups of assassins who are getting ready. Um, and so yeah. that's like the ones you see. He's hitting them throughout the scene. Um, Yes, you have the one that have they have these. These are real shotgun shells. I know because this like there was a whole period in the Internet on YouTube where you could see like 
footage of people who are very fucking dumb shooting these um, in their backyard <laughs> or whatever, but they're called Dragon's Breath, and you can see it. It's like they show you very clearly. They're Dragon's Breath shotgun shells that are incendiary shotgun shells that are like the most video game thing that actually exists in real life. Um, that doesn't seem like any fucking... I don't think any group uses these for like a legitimate military purpose or something like that because it's such a weird exotic thing but they are real and yet so they show you the dragon's breath um which is supposed to be able to burn through the armor um but then of course the first thing that happens is john gets one of those um and then you get this just insane extended one -er of the camera pulling up looking down like it's Hotline Miami or something is the comparison it's, I've seen this is so Miami. funny Sean is I said Hotline Miami my friend Chris in his review we both independently wrote reviews where we used the term Hotline Miami the movie uh, which is basically what it becomes here I, yes. I had to go home and download Hotline Miami on my PS4 and play it a little bit because even the music here does like kind of the Hotline, mm -hmm. Hotline Miami heavy techno um, and like that movie and the first John Wick came out right around the same time so like I've always kind of connected them a little bit and I it was yes but go on. It's so yes. cool. Yeah, but it's basically, you know, it's just this top-down view. Um, and the, and it's it's that, and it's that it's a one -er, right? Which these yes. movies don't usually do the big, really long one-take thing. Like, they'll do some longer one-take style sequences. But they've never done the, like, this is to be, like, you feel it. That this is, you know, like the Children of Men scene or something like that. Where you can feel, oh my god, we have been going for, like, five minutes or something they haven't cut. Um, this is the first time I feel like they've done one of those where you're feeling it. That's like it's going and going and going. But what I love is that they have combined that with this conceptual thing with the shot, which is that it's top down, which makes it feel fresh. Um, so it do it never feels like it's the, you know, daredevil thing that happened with that show where every season they had to be like, oh, fuck, we got to do a big one or action scene because we did that in episode two of season one. And they never did it as good as that one because it happened organically narratively for that episode. And they just kept on trying to do it because they were obligated to do it and just made it technically complex. But here it's that it's combined with this whole spatial thing as you're seeing him move through this space and getting to see the moving pieces of how everybody is going around and how John is taking out these guys. And, you know, this is the fourth one of these movies. We've seen a lot of scenes of John Wick mowing through dudes with a shotgun, but you've never seen it like that from that perspective. And it just adds such a, like fresh nature to the action you've just i've never seen anything do this before um and it's another one where i would love to see some behind the scenes shit of like technically speaking how do they put the shot together i have to guess there are probably some hidden cuts as it goes through um some of like the structure of where you're looking at like the ceilings and stuff like the shots can be segmented in such a way that i'm curious if they have hidden cuts there and things like that um but it just is it such a com complex sequence um, that is fucking incredible looking. Yeah, it's it definitely boggles the mind. There's just there's a there's a smoothness to it that like, you know, the the actual construction of the set wouldn't be that hard on a set. Sound stages are very tall, mm -hmm. and so you can build this set where you just take the. I mean, most sets in sound stages don't have ceilings anyway. Yeah. So this is this is partially just something you could do with most sets. Um, but what you have to do is you have to get the camera up there and they even have, they don't like start with the camera up there. They do the crane shot up yes. from John Wick to the overhead view and then it goes. And I'm just unsure how the camera moves up there because it like, is it tracking from like a rig on the ceiling? Is it a, the crane moving overhead? If so, how is it moving through the walls? Uh, is it possibly like a drone that they're doing? But can a drone carry a camera that is that, heavy duty high resolution because there's no like it's not a different camera they're using mm -hmm. here it's like all of that it's just very smooth you also have he's fucking using the dragon's breath shells throughout yeah. this scene so people are lighting on fire that really makes it feel like hotline miami it's just uh -huh. the, the level of carnage that is going on here but yeah it is just like hey we're 30 minutes from the end of this franchise let's show off let's just fucking show off and they do it and it's amazing yeah, and there's definitely just some incredible moments, particularly like with the fire where there's my favorite is there's one part where he like shoots a dude with a dragon's breath. The guy gets lit on fire. He starts screaming, runs out of the room. It like runs around the hallway. John Wick's finding some other dudes. The guy goes all the way around. It comes in through another door and gets shot again um, while he's screaming and on fire the entire time. Uh, <laughs> that's probably the funniest thing that happens in the whole movie. And it's like it's very easy to miss, but it's fucking it's amazing. It's yeah, it's just all the little moving pieces and, and the 
fucking fire shells. Um, it's I, I really want this movie to come out on 4K Blu-ray so I can just watch that scene on yes. repeat a couple of times the way I did with the ending of John Wick 2 and 3 uh, because it is just totally fucking shit. They went to town um, and yeah, that, that is the the thing in this movie the most I want to see like a big detailed behind the scenes breakdown of technically yes. speaking, how did they do this? How did they like uh, they get the camera to do what the camera needs to do? How do they block out the scene and choreograph it? Um, and it, and again, like it being a one with like the fire stuff, um, like how much of that is digital, how much of those might, might have been some practical effects. Like there's just so many different elements to that scene that make it really technically complex um, that I, I'm just so fascinated by how they even did it. Yeah. And it again, it is also that kind of Busby Berkeley thing I was talking about of just the number of bodies on screen mm -hmm. because you're pulled high up. It's John and a lot of people on screen at the same time moving in tandem. And that alone just makes it wild. Uh, this is also where you have a lot of Mr. Nobody going around with his cool dog doing cool dog shit is in this part of the movie. And it's very good. Yeah, this so. is where you have him needling Bill Skarsgård on the phone. Um, yes. Which, like I said, another one of my favorite moments in the movie where he's, you know, like rank, ranking up the price um, and hangs up on him multiple times. And one time he hangs up when Bill Skarsgård doesn't acquiesce. It, Bill Skarsgård gets pissed off and he throws his cell phone at the ground and smashes it. And I saw them like, well, that's dumb. Why would the character now he can't call? Him? And then cuts you get a little bit more of the action. And then he gets, then Mr. Nobody gets the call again, and it cuts back to Bill Skarsgård. And there's like a maid that is holding like an antique old phone on a platter, old, like that, rotary telephone. <laughs> yeah, that he's talking on, and he, has, he hangs it up, and she walks away. And that like little visual gag is so funny that he's got this like old like <laughs> early 20th century rotary phone um, on a platter for him to talk to. Uh, it's it's fucking great. So good. Uh, yeah, love all of that. And then we get the piece de resistance, which is John gets to the base of some stairs and the DJ lady on the radio says, he's got to go up 250 stairs. And they do this big track, you know, pan up to see the full breadth of the stairs. And I go, he's going to fall down all those stairs, isn't he? And indeed, we get an elaborate fight up the stairs and then he falls down all of those stairs and I'm frankly amazed that I am with you here to record this podcast, Sean, because I thought I was going to asphyxiate laughing when he started falling, because it is the most perfectly executed piece of slapstick in this whole series. Uh, just the the patience of the setup of getting up all those stairs. You know they're going to send him back down, but boy, they send him back down. It is so funny. And then it gets serious when Donnie Yen comes to, to help his brother up and get all the way up those stairs again. It is the most perfect John Wick moment. Yeah, it's incredible. Like the the most John Wick touch of it, honestly, is that he doesn't go down all of the stairs immediately. It's like he gets yes. <laughs> he gets up at the top. Um, the Marco Zoro character fights him, kicks him down. He rolls down the stairs and, it, and, you know, he rolls down the stairs for a long time. You think he's hit the bottom and the Marco Zoro character like slides down and gets next to him, kicks him again. And you realize, oh, no, he landed on the flight like the landing. That's halfway. <laughs> and so he rolls down the second half of the stairs all the way to the bottom of uh, that little extra touch that you thought it was the bottom. No, that was actually only halfway. Now he has to do it again. Um, pretty amazing. But then, yes, so that's incredibly funny. It's just such a good setup and payoff. And then having the Donnie Yen character show up and you get to have them fighting together to get up the, the stairs in like two minutes or however much time he has until sunrise. Um, incredibly good payoff uh, to their whole relationship, ending with that great little moment where Donnie Yen's like, you know what, you owe me. And then he just stabs John Wick in the hand with his sword of this very yes. like sort of nonchalant way. It's like, ah. No, now we're even. It's so good. And, I mean, you also have Mr. Nobody there sniping. And so they're all three of them are basically mm -hmm. working together to get John up those stairs. And uh, he fucking makes it because, of course, he is. He's, he will. He's John Wick. And we get the final duel, which, uh, you know, we've had all the action we could ever want. So this is much more of a cerebral kind of, you know, final fight sequence. But, man, it is it is still so satisfying, I think, the way they do it all where... You know, I, I think John Wick could win that thing pretty easily if he wanted to. He's the best shot in the world, um, even with this old ass dueling pistol. And instead, of course, he he has it is this, you know, kind of come to Jesus moment for the character of realizing killing just continuing to kill everyone is not going to actually solve the problem. And 
doing this for the Donnie Yen character while still finding a way to take out that piece of shit marquee and humble the entire high table organization is the best outcome here for everyone. And I think watching that all play out, it's also just very tense. I mean, a duel mm-hmm. is a very cinematic thing where you can use the whole wide frame and you can have them, they keep coming closer and you have this, you know, this big kind of like, you know, build up and release. And it is just, I, I remember like in the theater, you can feel the tension from everyone yeah. holding their breath before every shot. Yeah, and it's it's just that thing of it's it's the contrast as well is so powerful because you've had this incredibly frantic, long, long sequence of three different massive action set pieces that are about John Wick desperately fighting through an insane number of different foes to try to get to this um the Sacra Cour, the, the church to do this duel. And then the duel is so slow and nail biting and tense. It's also like the best use of the body armor that they've done since two, where they've you know, in order to be able to re- have John Wick be able to do judo stuff, he's got this light, like body armor suit and everyone else has their body armor suits. So that the way you have like this different choreo. Um, but then like the best use of those suits is here, him taking it off, right? Because you've yeah. seen him be able to shrug off all these hits. It's the only way he's been able to survive to this point is he's had this like the best suit he's had so far. Um, and then he has to take it off and it's just a white shirt. You know, and it's so it's it's the vulnerability there becomes heightened because of how like sort of not invulnerable, but how powerful he was before and how and all of his equipment before. And now it's just like this shitty old like one shot pistol and his sort of like wits and his morals. Right. And like, what does he want to do? How does he want to go out? How does he need this to end? What does he want to accomplish? Like it all just gets to get focused to that point and then you just get to ratchet up that tension as you're trying to figure out how do we get out of this because as much like you know as much as john obviously doesn't want to kill the donnie yen character you as the audience also desperately do not want to see the donnie Donnie yen character die because you like him so much you have this beautiful scene before all this happens um in the church after all the germany stuff where, you know, it's probably the most dialogue that John Wick has in this movie. He has this conversation with the Donnie Yen character, where it's just them getting to be friends for, like, one last time. And you just get this last moment of them bonding and get to see how kind of, how much these characters do care about each other and how similar they are um, and how they come from the same place. So you also, as an audience member, the tension isn't just, like, is John Wick going to die? Is he going to win this duel? It's like, how do we get out of this scenario with neither of these people dying or like, or ideally you, you don't want either of them to die. Um, like how, how does this play out in a way that's best? Um, and it's hard for you to sort of envision how that's going to happen until the Marquis steps in and says, let me finish the coup de gras. Like I, I request the right for the coup de gras. And that's the moment where you're like, yes, this is it. Like you, cause as soon as, yes. as with any great, like twist in a plot, a great twist in a plot works best when the audience figures out the twist about 30 seconds before it actually plays out. And I think that's the moment when he comes out where you re- know, like I j- didn't look like John actually shot his pistol that last time. Oh, now the now he's come out. The marquee has entered as the next as his opponent in the duel officially, and you can see exactly what's going to happen as soon as he steps out. So you are like one step ahead of the marquee before the marquee gets fucking a bullet between his eyes. It's just masterfully played. Masterfully played, absolutely. Um, it's it's very. Uh, this is another movie I've seen Chad Stahelski mention. It's very Barry Lyndon, this mm-hmm. uh, Stanley Kubrick movie, which has some uh, infamously silly <laughs> dual sequences in it. Uh, and this definitely feels like it's got a little bit of that in its blood. But yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that scene that they have in the in the other church where. It's a very like kind of classical Catholic cathedral where you go in and there's candles everywhere and you go up and you use the sticks to like light the candles. Um, I don't. I've been in churches like that and they're they're you know very. Uh, it's it's captured very well in that mm-hmm. scene. And I think then them sitting down and it's not just their friendship, but I think some of that dialogue is really beautiful. John has the line about like, you know, I'm I'm talking to or praying to my wife and and Donnie and asks him, well, do you think it's do you think it's real? Do you think she's out there? There's an afterlife. And John thinks about it for a second and says, no, but, you know, what if I'm wrong? And I really love that. There's something about kind of, because what that scene is really saying in between the lines is I do think it's John making peace with the idea that he's probably, this is probably the end of the line. Um, and, you know, I think his determination in a lot of the last act of this movie is 
to get there and try to like do right by the kind of web of consequences that have like built up around him and Donnie Yen and Bill Skarsgård, not so much get out of this thing alive and go mm-hmm. live forever happily, you know? Um, and it just, it's, it's the right thing. It is, is ending John Wick on the note where he is able to do something positive for someone else and kind of keep someone else and their family going instead of just sort of him, just kind of continuing for no specific reason anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really beautifully done. I, I think that last scene where he sits down on the steps after the duel is over and he's kind of said farewell to everyone and he's remembering his wife and Keanu's last words in the series is he just says heaven and then no, he says He says like, Helen, which is her name. Oh, okay, Helen. That makes more sense. I thought it was a... Uh, I thought he said the word, I thought, because they have a line about heaven and hell earlier, and I thought it was about him thinking about this being his, like, this was what meant most to me. That's interesting. Okay. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm like 99% certain he said Helen. Uh, that, that's because that's his they are si- They are similar words. They are one letter off. Yeah, uh, and he's well, thinking about her because they intercut between yes. no, I know. him on the steps yeah, and but, Helen. But anyway, it, either way, I think it's a beautiful moment. That I, again, as good as like the original John Wick was, I don't know if you would ever have imagined that we'd build up to a death scene that is kind of like that resonant and lovely. Um, But it really works. Yeah. And everything like building up to that moment as well of, you know, um, when Don Yin comes over and just says like, my brother and puts his hand on John Wick's shoulder. Um, The last conversation he has with Winston, um, where Winston like looks down at the stomach wound, the last hit that John got that was like not. You know, every other hit was like on the shoulder or on the arm, but he got like a center of mass hit in his stomach. Um, that's, you know, what what gets him. And, you know, you see Winston looking at it and that's sort of the first thing that sells you that, oh, this is, you know, probably John's going to die. Um, but he asked Winston, it's like, can you take me home? He says, of course, Jonathan, um, yeah. which is a very good moment. Absolutely. Um, you know, they do leave themselves open <laughs> in so much as we do not see his like dead body. We don't see him mm-hmm. cremated or anything. We cut from him slumping over to his tombstone that has does have the words, you know, beloved husband on it. And so, you know, you can do John Wick 5 where he lived somehow, although I feel like it would really undercut what they pulled mm-hmm. off here. It, it would feel wrong to me. Yeah, I just don't know how narratively you pull him in. Like, I did, like if he's still alive, um, like, how do you get him to come back into this world and kill a bunch of people again? Like, that's just, you know, I think you could do with, you know, like, I think you could have a version of this movie that ended with, like, you you have the grave and then the last scene was actually John Wick's, like, on a boat on a lake or something, you know, and he's, like, living in peace and he and that he didn't actually die. I think you could do that um, if they had wanted to, and that would have been a totally acceptable ending as well. So I think I prefer him dying, but I don't think you can have him fight again if he's alive like there's just no way to bring him back into that stuff i mean one thing about the way this series has been structured is that like since the beginning of movie two they haven't had to justify new reasons for him to come out like these movies are structured in such a way that like two ends with a setup for how he would still be fighting in three and three ends with a setup for how he would still be fighting with four four ends in such a way that if you did a five you would have to do so much narrative legwork to get to a place where Mm. it would feel realistic for him to come out again and i just don't think that would be fun like part of the fun of two three four is how light on their feet they are and just getting into it you know um yeah, and and again, it does. I do think him dying feels right. I just like it's kind of what this series is about. It's it's hard for me to imagine the that you could have the ending where he's like living peacefully on a boat. But I think the question this movie asks, and I think it's right, is kind of like what for? Like what mm-hmm. is he living for? And is it better for him to have a good death where he kind of feels good about himself? And that's okay. Uh, and I think it is okay. And you know, there is a. I do think there's an interesting. There's an interesting paper to be written, maybe I'll write it one day, about we are in a moment where Hollywood movies are comfortable killing their protagonists. And not just mm-hmm. their protagonists, but like long-term protagonists. You know, Iron Man dies in Avengers Endgame. James Bond dies in No Time to Die. John Wick dies here. Uh, and in all of them in fairly unambiguous ways. John Wick slightly more ambiguous in that we don't see the body, but like it, it's his grave at the end of the movie, right? Yeah. Um, and that's interesting to me. I do think it's interesting that, you know, and, and some of these series are characterized by 
a real lack of mortality. Superhero, the superhero genre is very characterized by a lack of actual death stakes. James Bond has been a character who has not died in 60 years of movies, right? Um, and John Wick even is a shorter franchise, but it comes from a tradition where the hero does not usually die on screen. And I just do think there's something interesting about bringing in the mortality of these characters because it is poignant and, and I do find it effective. And obviously... One thing about it is that it is, if, if you really do want to end a series, this is the best way to do it definitively so you don't yeah. have people trying to make you make another one. Like, Daniel Craig, he is out. He does not yes. have to play James Bond anymore. They blew him up. He's good to go. You know, Robert Downey Jr., I think, mostly is in the same camp. Uh, he's, he's good to go. You know, Keanu has a very good out. If they want to make him make more, he can go, I died, motherfuckers. I'm done. Um, but I do think also for the audience, there's a closure that is interesting. Yeah. And I do wonder how much of that is also connected to, you know, all of those you're talking about. Those are all men who are in their 50s. Right. So it's. Oh, like, yeah. 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 So I think that's like part of it as well as there's just like this for these kinds of movies. I feel like the average age of the leading man is so much older than it used to be. Um, so there's like this sense of the it's kind of like the datification of video games in some ways. It's the datification <laughs> of movies yeah. that it's it's about these older men who have lived this life that are being pulled back into this life and that like, you know, and that they can't keep up with that world anymore. Right. That's kind of the broad narrative of all those. And it is, I think, an interesting narrative trend that you are seeing. Um, that's pretty unique, um, particularly for like yeah. what is you know, are like very like mainstream big blockbuster movies. I am 99.9% .9 sure that the last Fast and Furious movie, which is not this next one, but they're saying it'll be the 11th one will be the last one, will end with Vin Diesel dying on screen. Like, there's just no way they're not going to do that, right? Like, especially, I, I don't know, if, I guess you haven't seen those movies, Sean, but they've really gone all in on, because Vin Diesel is like the lead creative at this point, on the Dom is a fucking human saint and is the best person on earth. And so, of course, it's going to end with his deification and martyrdom when he dies. He's probably going to, like, drive his car into a flaming volcano to stop an explosion or something. And then, of course, the end of the movie will be everyone crying over there, the, the man who kept their family together. But that's, like, 100% how those movies are going to end. There's just no way that's not how it ends. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any of those movies, but I did see the the trailer for Fast 10 played in front of John Wick 4. And I was kind of struck about how I feel like since like Fast 5, you know, I've seen all the trailers for all of these movies. I just haven't actually <laughs> seen any of the movies. But since Fast 5, the trailers have always sold them as big ensemble movies. Um, that obviously Vin Diesel is a part of the ensemble, but they leaned on all the other characters, I feel like, as much as the Vin Diesel character. Um, but the trailer for Fast 10, you know, obviously they still show you other characters, but it feels like it leans on, oh, this is about Dom. Like this is like the, all the story and all like the way the trailer is angled. It did feel like it's like, it's about Vin Diesel, motherfucker. I was like, I feel like these movies have not been about Vin, at least based on the trailers, have not been about Vin Diesel for a long time. Um, Th this has been the problem with uh, the Fast movies since, so Seven is the last one that I think is really good. And that is the one where um, the the Brian character, his the the actor Jack Walk. Uh, uh, why am I forgetting his name? Uh, pa something Walker. Paul Walker. Paul Walker. I wanted to call I, him Patrick even, Walker, and I, I knew that was wrong. Movies, and I know who Paul. Walker I'm sorry. Is. Paul, we're talking about a lot of stuff today. Paul Walker. He he died during that movie, and so that. But they finished it, and since that film. Eight and nine have come out, and those are by far the worst ones. And they are very Vin Diesel centric in a, and they're also like very dour. And everything we've heard from behind the scenes is that since then, basically Vin Diesel has like very much concentrated creative power over those movies and kind of gone mad with on an ego trip. Which is why I, I don't know if you heard this on the new one, Fast Ten. Justin Lin walked the director walked off the set after three days. Oh wow! And they had to, yeah, they had to get a new director. Louis Leterrier came in to finish the movie because, and it was apparently Justin Lin could not work with Vin Diesel anymore. So that is again my contention that it will die with him dying is because Vin Diesel wants to martyr himself on screen. Uh, I don't think that is the motivation for like this or the James Bond thing. It's mm -hmm. a slightly different thing. But it is interesting, and I and I do think getting back to John Wick, it is the right ending for this movie and this story. Uh, but it is always interesting to see them pull the trigger when they do it, you know. Yeah, and I think for me with like John Wick, I think like what they should do is I like, and they're already doing this, right? Like expand it instead of doing John Wick, expand the world and do other stuff in the setting, or even if it's not even necessarily the setting. Like I just want to see Chad Stahelski direct more action movies you know like that's yeah. that's like the main thing i'm interested in i'm curious what like 
Keanu's going to do next as like, you know, obviously he's been in other stuff while these movies have come been coming out, but it's kind of felt like the John Wick movies have been like the Keanu priority or whatever, because it's like this big franchise that he kind of helped grow from this little thing. Um, so I'm curious to see like kind of what direction he goes in. I pray to fucking Jesus that he doesn't go to Marvel. Like, just please don't. Yes. I don't want to see him in the post credit scene of a Marvel movie, please. Um, but I want to see what he, where he goes. I want to see what Chad Stahelski does. I know that he's attached to like 500 projects or whatever. Um, but I'm also curious to see like this ballerina movie um, and other stuff of other spinoffs that I know that they're planning on making. Because I do think this world and this setting is you know something we do not get a lot of these days which is like an interesting original ip that feels like has a lot of corners that you could explore right like i would love a john wick style like video game set in this world you know i would they should put out some fucking comic books or whatever like this is an ip in a franchise that is cool enough and the world is cool enough that i think you could get other creators in the setting like it's a little bit unfortunately that it's just called john wick because that's a bad name for a franchise because it's just the character's name <laughs> um yes but like there's like so much you could do with this crazy world of assassins with other characters and that's one thing that this movie i think also shows by giving us these kind of co-protagonist characters like kane um it shows you how i think flexible the fundamental premise and setting is for john wick um that even with john gone there are other corners that you could explore and other things you could do with this franchise. Yeah. For people who don't know that ballerina film, that is the one that is, is Ana de Armas is playing. Um, it's a character we kind of see in John Wick three, this ballerina mm -hmm. on stage at Angelica Houston's place where John goes. And so she, Ana de Armas is the character. Angelica Houston is in it again. Keanu and Ian McShane and Lance Reddick all show up in it. It's written by Shay Hatton who wrote, co-wrote three and Emerald Fennell, who is just a very uh, good writer and director, she is probably best known right now for the movie uh, *Promising Young Woman* with um, uh, Carrie Mulligan, and it's then it's directed by Len Wiseman, who did the *Underworld* movies. Uh, he also did *Live Free or Die Hard*, which is probably a slightly underrated *Die Hard* movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm I'm curious about that one. That'll be that'll be an interesting that'll be interesting to see if the series can survive outside Chad Stahelski is like my question mark with it. Mm -hmm. Um, because he's been the, you know, director on all four of these so far. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that. They're, they're also making that show with fucking Mel Gibson about the Continental. Not super excited about that because of the Mel Gibson of it all. But we'll see. Um, there's Keanu and Chad Stahelski are not involved in that. Um, Chad Stahelski has been hired. He is the director on board for the, um, Ghost of Tsushima movie that Sony mm -hmm. is making. And I did see him have a comment the other day about that movie saying he wants to make it the most colorful samurai movie of all time. And I went, you know what? I kind of want to see this. <laughs> this guy knows what he's doing. That is a smart thing to do with that. Either you make that movie in black and white or you make it ludicrously colorful the way he's done with John Wick. And I like that idea. Yes. And, you know, you've already he's got a relationship with Hiyuki Sanada and you could have him play the uncle character. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, he'd be perfect in that. So I'm curious. I mean, I, I his the only movies he's directed so far are these four John Wick movies. So I am excited to see what he does because what a fucking resume that is. Uh -huh, um, yeah. Where you go from there. Also, man, I was on his Wikipedia page. I knew he had a long stunt history. Did you know he was Brandon Lee's stunt double on The Crow? He was there when all that yes. went down. Yeah, I remember hearing that's about that. Yeah, wild. Obviously, he had nothing to do with the. If you don't know, that's the movie where Brandon Lee was shot and killed by a. A defective blank um but it's actually the scenes that were finished in the movie where they put brandon lee's face on the stunt double he's that stunt double Crazy. that they used to finish the crow um yeah he's had a he's had a long fucking career in in the industry yeah i mean i know like one thing with stahelski is that he is a huge proponent of using cg and like digital stuff for the guns like to like avoid exactly like the yeah. the potential danger of misfires or blanks getting shot when people are too close or something being in the barrel right um you had that tragic um thing on that set for that western movie a couple of years ago um where with alec baldwin yeah, with alec baldwin, Hutchinson, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so like you know those things are really dangerous so i assume that that experience i just know i've read all the quotes with him talking about how like you don't need to do that shit anymore because it's like that is a very easy cheap digital effect you can do if you know what you're doing with like being able to get the lighting and stuff on set right like you do not need to fire blanks on set like it's not a thing that yeah. we have to do anymore um that's and it's just like one of those things about these movies is i think that like his background as being a stunt person and understanding that world 
and like like the both from the like what can we do how can we film it thing but also like the safety and the philosophy and all of that i just feel like it's that love for stunt work is so at the core of what john wick is and it's just a tradition that you just don't really see in american filmmaking other than if you go back to like the silent film era where that was very common and like the actor or the director being someone who was from this world and did the stunts or knew the stunt people and all that kind of stuff hollywood used to have that tradition back in the day um but for a long time we kind of moved away from that and i do feel like stahelski has helped like usher in this new era of this appreciation for stunt work and how central it is for these kinds of films and how important it is to like treat it with respect and give it this very elevated uh, position in the production because it does, you know, as you can see with him, it also like is part of the direction and it is part of the cinematography. It's part of the production design. It's part of every, the stunt work for a movie like this touches everything that the movie does. And so if you treat it with that respect and approach it with that level of expertise, you're going to get a great fucking movie out of it. It's also safety. Like, I think it is an underrated part of these movies is that there have not been injury stories from the mm -hmm. sets of John Wick. And like, it's very common for a lot of other Hollywood movies, including ones where nothing should be happening for someone to get hurt, getting hurt. And the only injury I've heard of on the John Wick movies was I think Halle Berry broke a couple ribs in rehearsal is what she said uh, for John Wick 3. And like, I don't know, for four movies, that's a pretty good track record. Yeah. Like, you know, and again, I do think it's because the people running this, like, that's the thing about stuntmen is I think we have this like cultural understanding of, oh, they do crazy shit. They do do crazy shit, but they're also like, they're safety nuts. They know what they're yeah. doing. Their whole goal is to get through the production with no one getting hurt. That's why you have stuntmen. Um, and yeah, it makes total sense to me that Chad Stahelski would be like, no, we're not putting fucking blanks in the gun. Are you crazy? Like, yeah, if you can do it without it, of course you're going to. And, and I think it is, it's, it's one of the things that is nice about a good action movie shot by professionals is when you know, uh, generally speaking that, you know, they kept people safe or you go the other extreme and Jackie Chan is trying to kill himself on screen. That's also fun, but it's fun in a different way. Um, but you know, Jackie yeah, Chan at is, least is like, up for it. Yeah, I mean, he's like directing the movie and he's doing all this yes, shit. That's, so it's like, right. if he wants to do it, like he he can. Yes, he's not hurting other people. I guess yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. So anyway, but it's been such a cool journey with these movies, Sean. It still just boggles my mind that they exist. That this mm -hmm. is a part of in the same Hollywood landscape where you have, you know, Marvel doing whatever it's doing these days. That you have John Wick four. It almost doesn't compute, but it's so cool that it's out there. Uh, and that, like, it's been rewarded by the public. I mean, the box office on these movies is really crazy to me. I mean, let's just go by the opening weekends, Sean. John Wick 1, $14 million opening weekend. John Wick 2, $30 million, doubled it. John Wick 3, $56 million, almost doubled it. John Wick 4 this weekend is estimated at $73 million. Like, that upward trajectory is crazy you just don't see that and like given the and i think it's worldwide opening this weekend was over 100 million um it's probably gonna outgross the fucking ant-man movie the new marvel movie uh -huh. that's in theaters that has effectively bombed worldwide i think this is an underreported story so i think marvel has their first true bomb on their hands um and like it's interesting that that john wick is coming in and cleaning up like this and again it is it is kind of a pure word of mouth franchise hit yeah, that, that just goes against so many of the trends that you see with lots of modern, modern movies. Um, yeah, that it's, yeah. you know, it is a success so, so deeply well earned um, that you love to see it. Absolutely. So whatever these people do next, I am excited to see it. Keanu, I, I just hope Keanu is living his best and happiest life because I love him to death. What a guy. Yeah, he seems to be doing it good, you know? It's like, it's one oh, of the yeah. fun things about the John Wick movies is you get to see all the, um, like, interviews with the cast and stuff um, promoting the movie, and it's just, everybody that works on these movies just seems like the coolest people in the world, you know? Um, it's just fun to see them get to have a good time and talk about their work and, you know, are so enthusiastic about this kind of stuff. There was an interview with Lance Reddick before he died that was making the rounds um, when he passed, talking about this this episode where he was shooting his scene for John Wick 4 and it was Keanu Reeves' birthday and Keanu came to set just to give Lance a card saying how much he appreciated him, basically. 
Um, and Lance Reddick has this amazing quote where it's, it's Keanu came to the set with his girlfriend. And Lance Reddick went out of his way to explain how cool he found Keanu's girlfriend, which yeah. was really funny. He said, man, he's got the coolest girlfriend. And I talked to her and she said, Lance, you know, it was his birthday. And I asked if he wanted to do anything else before the day ended. And he said, you know, I just want to go see Lance. And I don't know. I just, it warms my heart to such a amazing degree that these movies exist. And seemingly a lot of the people on them are just very nice. Uh, and I don't know if that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. It's, you know, it's like, I want to go see Lance and then tomorrow I'm going to shoot 500 people in the head uh, <laughs> and get hit by five cars. This is what I want to do. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. We're going to go play more Resident Evil. We're going to talk about Resident Evil later. Maybe go see John Wick again. So it's a good time to be alive. Yes. I mean, like I said on last week's podcast, what I was looking forward to do this weekend was to go see John Wick 4. And then after seeing John Wick 4, shoot a bunch of people in Resident Evil 4 Remake and pretend to be John Wick. And that is exactly what I've been doing. And hell, it's a good fucking time.